welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a very special guest, Persephone May Holloway, which I'll let all you guys know that's not her real name. And I won't tell you her real name because she doesn't want me to tell you that. So anyway, uh, she is a musician, an experiencer, a writer, a disclosure advocate. She creates me. Uh, oh, her face jumped up. Hold on a second. Uh, she creates music based on her connection with the with the phenomena. She is the podcast creator and co-host for the KLU or Keep Looking Up podcast. And uh, that podcast focuses on disclosure, post-disclosure, and the new paradigm. She hopes to become more involved with exopolitics as time goes on. And she spends her free time making sure other experiences know they're not alone. Uh, welcome to tonight's, to tonight's show, Persephone May Holloway Not. <laughs> well, thank you. And I do want to add, the only reason I use a pseudonym is for my family, because they're not all into this. Um, I don't hide my identity very well. And I assure you, people have found out who I am and know who I am. Like, it's not it's not like a, I don't want people to know. I'd be way more cautious. But um, no, it's just a keeping my family distant from this a little bit. That's all. So what? Well, as you can see, I'm unprepared. <laughs> it's okay. I, have, I feel that way every day. I'm going to cut this out. But uh, here we go. This is what I was looking for. There we go. Uh -huh, I didn't realize it was getting dark. All right. So now we have light. And let's see if that's appropriate. Yes. Okay. So uh, please tell the audience... You are a contactee, not an objectee, correct? Correct. So these terms are often used, you know, interchangeably. Uh, for me personally, I've had very positive experiences over most of my life. So even though I have been taken, I don't like to say that I was abducted because there's an aspect of my consent to this. Uh, so it's not, for me, it's abductee implies like an abduction, a kidnapping. And for me, that's not what it's become over time. I've kind of come to the realization like, oh, I agreed to this. Um, so that's that's why I use that. So I usually say contactee or experiencer. So how did you come to the conclusion that you gave permission? Uh, because my first encounter that I recall uh, with my entity which I don't know if you want me to go into, but basically he asked me if I would come with him. And my response was, well, I can't because my mom's going to get mad because I'm, you know, I have to go to school, but it wasn't a no. And he knew that it wasn't a no, I don't want to go. It's like, yeah, I want to come with you. I just can't today, like now. Um, did so, he respect that? Yeah, he did. He said, okay, I'll come back for you another day. And he did. So. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> you really did give permission. Yeah, I did. At least I did. I can't say that for everyone. I'm not I'm not going to blanket state. That's how it is for everyone. Oh, I understand. But, yeah. So uh, before and what was his name again? So his name is Demetrius. At least that's the name that he goes by. Uh, we don't know what his real, you know, name out there is. But the impression that I've been given is with telepathic species. There's a lot of nuance. So even if you knew their name, you don't know them. It's like you get a it's almost like a full block of information instead of just a name. So there, to know him would be to know like everything about him, not just the name, you know, it's interesting. So how old were you when you first met him? Uh, as well, that's an interesting question, but I was nine in that encounter that I just said, I think I knew him. I'm a believer in past lives. So I think I knew him prior, but, uh, in this world, life, incarnation, whatever you want to call it, um, I was nine when I met him. So before you met him, did you have any odd things happening in your life? Yes. Uh, okay, so when before, I, before yep. you get into those, uh, what was the very, very, very first unusual thing that happened to you in your life? Do you want me to tell you one that I found while under hypnosis? Or are we not going to count those? Because I'm happy to leave those out. Well, some people, you've seen some of the podcasts where the people talk about pre-birth knowledge. Yeah, I don't have, I don't know. So, you know, it, when I say the very first 
strange thing. It could be even before you were born. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I have, uh, like, for instance, my, I had clients, had at least one client who her first issue, when I regressed her, the very first issue she had was when she was in the womb. Uh, her uh, Another one was at the moment of conception. Her mother uh, felt shame because she was conceived out of wedlock. And uh, that affected her with, uh, actually killed her, but uh, wow. uh, her one of her legs didn't have any circulation in it. Wow. And that was the cause. It was because a moment of shame of her mother at the moment of conception. Now, you, you know, you think about the things that can affect you in your life. And, you know, you can think about past lives and then you can think about the things in this life. But you don't think yeah. about, you know, at the moment of conception that something could affect you enough to actually end your life. She was told she either needed to get her leg amputated wow. or she had to um, or she would die. And the option she chose was to go get hemotherapy. Now she came one session and then after that she didn't come back and she chose to move on. Yeah. She actually died from her leg issue. But, you know, I can't, you know, you think about life and death and I, I, um, I can't honestly say she made the wrong decision. It was her choice to, live right. or to be incarnate or not incarnate. That's your, your personal choice. And, I can't say she made the wrong. It was her choice. It's not it's not me for me to say. So back to your side. So the very first odd thing that ever happened to you, period, uh, no matter how you learned about it. I don't care. If you sure. OK. Uh, in this life. As in, you know, post conception, the first memory that I know I had now was I was in a crib and this being which traditionally we'd call a gray uh came and leaned over the crib to check on me and checked a spot behind my ear i have a, a mole behind my ear and it like checked this spot and kind of was like okay like like nodded like it's okay and that's the first memory that i have of like something weird and that's one that i uh uncovered working with fiona harris um through hypnotherapy and quantum regression and some other things that we were doing at that time. Why would an alien look at a mole? I don't think it's the mole. I think it's the the placement. I think it's there's an area behind the ear that a lot of contactees believe they have implants. I've yes. never gotten it scanned, so I couldn't say for sure, but it felt like they were just checking that area in general. So I suspect that may be why they were checking to make sure something was there. As you know, Willie still has his, right? I did not know that he still did, but I, I yeah, wasn't they, aware that he had it. Yeah. They tried to remove it. It moved. When this, there, you can see the, the surgery on online. Oh wow! But the guy didn't actually cut into it. He, or maybe he did. I think he maybe he did cut into it. Anyway, he tried to remove it. It moved, and he didn't feel comfortable pursuing the object. And so he told Whitley, you can't remove it because it's moving around. And yeah. uh, I talked to the, uh, you know who, um, um, God, the guy that does all the near-death interviews? I don't know his name, but I think I know who you're speaking about. Uh, Possibly. I'm bad with names if I don't like intimately know their stories. <laughs> so I might hold on a second. I'll give sure, you sure. a minute. I'll take a second. Uh, ah, Jesus. All right. So I'll probably remember it before I actually look it up. Uh, hold on. Sure. Jeff, Jeff Mara. I knew I would okay. remember it. You, you know who Jeff Mara is? The name sounds familiar, but now I'm not sure that that was who I was thinking of. So now I've got to look it up because no, you go ahead and tell me. <laughs> okay, so Jeff Mara interviewed me, and he. Okay. Um, what did you just say about? Oh yeah, the, the implant. With oh yeah, Whitley's implant. Jeff Mara met Whitley one time. I've met him once myself also. Oh nice. And uh, but 
I went to a book signing of his and made a point to be last in line so I could stand and talk to him. But uh, Jeff Mora met him one time and he, Willie let Jeff touch his implant behind his ear. So the fact that he has an implant, Jeff uh, kind of verified that he, he does have it because I've touched it. <laughs> yeah, so it's there. That's, so, it's wild. Anyway, uh, Jeff's a good person for you. If you don't know him, hit, being on his podcast would be a good thing for you if you haven't. I assume you haven't met, you don't know, you haven't been on his podcast, you don't know who he is. No, I'll have to go talk to him and find out. I'm, I'll, I'll seek him out. I'll go look. <laughs> oh, he's got a, he's got a large following. He makes, he was a car, I think he was a chiropractor and he makes more money as a YouTube podcaster than he did as a chiropractor. Isn't that crazy how that works? It's well, been, like if you, he did it for a long time before he made any money at it. Yeah. So you have to build up a following uh without making any money he's done well over 500 uh interviews at just in near-death experiences so i assume he's done six or seven hundred total or more wow overall you have to do a lot of interviews before you start making money yeah anyway, for me it's it's never been about the money or the uh the following for me it's just getting well the following maybe but only because i want to get the messages out there not not for the fame if that makes sense like it's not about that part of it for me it's about the the things that we talk about are very important and like you had mentioned i just want other experiencers to know they're not alone and i think it's important like to talk about it openly you know go to, go to your next uh interesting experience sure uh so the next time i remember uh i was four and i was at my neighbor's house and uh, she had a brand new, like, built-in waterfall hot tub in her backyard. And she went inside to go make lunch. And she was only leaving me for, like, a minute. But in that time, I decided I wanted to go look at it. And I fell in. And I couldn't swim. And I sunk right to the bottom. How and old I, I was four. Had okay. to be max four years old. All right, go ahead. And I felt two hands reach around my waist and push me up to the surface. Now there was no room for somebody to stand there like in the hot tub and, and push me up, but you know, hands encircled my waist and pushed me up and like, you know, I could reach the side. Now, the way my neighbor and my mom tell it, they're like, oh, the dog must've pulled you out. And I was like, the dog was like barking outside the whole time. And I wasn't pulled from above, hands lifted me up. And I always, you know, I'm, you know, my my parents or my mom was like, maybe it was an angel, but like, you know, we don't know what it was. But in general, so I don't remember this, but my mom says, like, tells these stories that I used to see angels all the time as a little girl. Now we say angels because my mom was Roman Catholic. So that was the frame of reference was I saw people that she couldn't see and she's called them angels. So then I called them angels because I assumed that's what they were. Um, not to say there's not angels or that wasn't what they were. It's just I'm assuming that was why I called them that. Um, and I used to say things like, oh, you know, mommy, the uh, the child angels are playing like ball with the grown up angels and like, you know, things like that. And so everyone assumed I was like making up imaginary friends like kids do. And it's like, oh, that's cute. She sees angels. Ha ha. So what did you see? Yeah. What did they look like? Uh, so the only description we have, because my mom has never kept track of that, was one time, was we were in the kitchen, I was three, in my high chair, and uh, it was the middle of the night, and I had woken her up to get water, which was apparently a pretty common occurrence. I would just be awake in the middle of the night, and I'd come and wake her up and be like, Mommy, I need water. And so she'd like take me downstairs to go get water. And we're sitting in the high chair or I'm sitting in the high chair and I'm looking behind her in the doorway. And I said, mommy, who's that man? And she kind of turned and there was nobody there. And she's like, what man? And I was like, he's glowing green and he's tall. He looks like daddy. That's the only description that we have because no other time did I ever describe to her what they look like apparently, or she never asked or she doesn't remember. So that's the one description we have. So he do you remember green. what the green man looked like? No, I don't have that memory. I have no memory of this. Like she well, just tells me this. Yeah. I've had strange 
memories as a kid too that that were not it they were not as strange as that but they're strange in their own way um i was sitting in the kid in the living room with my sister and my parents and there was a big um glass uh window it was not an opening window it was a static window sure and um and i looked out the window i was looking out the window and this guy pulled up in a old blue beat up car I, to this day i don't remember what model it was but it was just a old beat up car that no you'd never see anybody drive around because it was so old and beat up yeah. anyway he, he jumped out of the car uh faced the opposite direction uh, you know towards the back walked around the vehicle and made a big u-turn around the vehicle and when he got to the passenger door on the opposite side he turned to the right and walked up the the um the walkway to the house uh walked up there's only like two steps two or three steps he walked up pulled the screen door open knocked on the door while the screen door was open my dad immediately walked over and opened the door and the guy did not hesitate he walked in the house without you know you walk up some knock on somebody's door door and you don't know who they are they don't know who you are would you step inside their house no. yeah that's like, odd this guy stepped in the house and he was between uh he was like standing in that space where the where the door if it was shut it would hit him it's like in that open you know space inside the house where the door swings open right yeah. he's standing there and my father or my mother was standing there looking at his his direction and i could see the this part of his face at, on the right side but before when he got halfway to the house i looked out the door out the window at him and i knew instantly he was full-blooded indian now as a kid of six or five or four or whatever it was i didn't i don't even know if i knew what a full-blooded indian was uh, but i somehow i did but you knew, I don't know yeah. how I knew it. anyway the strange part of the story was is that from the point where i'm looking at him and i can only see part of his head that's where the story ends hmm. so you're like why doesn't the story keep going? Yeah, where's the rest of it? What happened? My, I think you'd remember. My sister doesn't remember. My mother doesn't remember. It, but my part of my memory of it doesn't extend past him standing in the doorway. And that's very strange for a memory just to stop right in the middle. Well, especially for everyone to not remember. Like, that's odd, you know? Well, the, I'm sure it was a, a real memory because... Yeah. No, it's like it happened. I remember like it happened yesterday, but uh, nobody remembers it except for me, and uh, and I only remember it to that point. Anyway, go on to your uh, next odd experience. Sure. Uh, so somewhere around the age of four, five, six, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, there was a point where we were at a restaurant, and so at this point, I think my mom, <clears throat> my mom, because of her faith, was convinced that I was seeing real angels and in her mind she was like oh you're gonna grow up to be like a catholic mystic or something because they see angels and you need a lot of angels to protect you so that's why you have so many like that's what she had in her head so she would like you know let me watch movies about like fatima and like saint Teresa and stuff like that so like kind of giving seeding those ideas a little bit you know um my dad just thought they were imaginary friends. He's an engineer, nuclear engineer, uh, civil specifically, not like the nuclear part itself. Very no nonsense. You know, he didn't really get it. The three of us are at a restaurant out in San Francisco. This is like the area we lived in at the time. And uh, we're sitting down to dinner and, you know, I'm talking to an imaginary friend all night. One of my friends, as I called it. And, you know, the waitress thought it was cute. And she's like, oh, I'll bring a plate for your friend. And I was like, they don't need to eat. That's OK. You know, and they're like, OK, uh, halfway through dinner, I say goodbye, like I'm waving goodbye. The front door of the restaurant opens and closes by itself and everyone turns to look. And in the quiet room, I just say, it's OK. My friend just had to leave. And like my parents both remember this story. So that was the first time where they were like, maybe 
maybe there's something to this. Like, you know, like, this is weird, you know. <laughs> you finally got it back. <laughs> yeah, it's like, ha <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's almost, it's funny in hindsight, it's like maybe that was their way of proving to them that it was real, so they didn't think I was crazy. I don't know, but... Uh, oh, let's, let's stop for a second. So, yeah. so uh, do you remember what your friend looked like? No, I wish I did. You don't? No, I don't. I have no memory of these stories, and that's what's frustrating. So there's a lot of memories that I don't have. Now, if I went back in, like, hypnotherapy, would I remember? Maybe. But, like, I've never tried because... Oh, no, you would. Yeah. You would, would I? Okay. Yes. I try not to push too much with regressions because I don't want to feed anything, especially if I think it's something weird. I'm, like, afraid to, like, put anything in my head that isn't actually there, you know? Well, if you ever want to pick up any missing time, just give me a call. Yeah, and we'll take <laughs> we'll care talk. of it. We'll I'm, talk. A, I'm a very good hypnotherapist. I haven't worked with a client in ages, but it's not something you ever forget how to do. It's like riding a bicycle, yeah. only, e only easier. So um, I like to tell people hypnotherapy is the safest and the easy. Uh, it's the easiest thing in the world to learn, and it's the safest thing to do. And I was scared of it when I first got tried to get hypnotized and and I had the belief that you know when you're hypnotized you're you're unconscious and they have control of it. and you're not unconscious and they don't have control no of it. no you 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 can't they can't do anything that you don't want to do but an interesting point that my friend Fiona has pointed out is experiencers seem to be much more easily put under than other people which is interesting she's like she's like experiencers are a lot easier to like put under into a state and that but she doesn't know why that is but it's just really fascinating um well, anyway my experience with hypnosis is that under hypnosis your far your memory is far more accurate and yeah. i've asked uh, many 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 clients questions that were leading on purpose to see if they would go down a leading question avenue Interesting. just to see if they were easily led and not not a single person has ever said yes and gone down. Yeah, they're like, no, that's not what no, was that's happening. Not, yeah, <laughs> that's not like, what they happened. Tap like this, they do yeah. it every time. They, nobody has ever. I've never been able to lead a person under hypnosis ever. Yeah, interesting. When, when actively trying. So anyway, back to you. Uh, next interesting. Yeah. Piece. Oh gosh. So. I would just, there would be a lot of strange paranormal things. And I'm trying to think of an exact example to give you. So by the time we moved to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is where I've now lived ever since, like I've moved houses, but that's like where I've lived since the age of um, eight. So we moved here when I was eight and we've been in Bucks County, Pennsylvania ever since. Um, ever since we moved there, I have experienced so much high strangeness um especially in my parents old house it was that whole neighborhood was just very creepy like anyone who's lived there i've talked to people like i actually had a music student years later who said that she knew a family who lived there and like they left like they moved because it was so creepy and so much weird. she was like the the mom was pushing a stroller and it like got pushed away from her like something grabbed it from her like it it's a scary place anyway there's like weirdness but um while I was living there, I would experience a lot of, I'm going to say, like, leftover hauntings or something. Like, I don't even know. The, the neighborhood itself was very new, but the land there is very old. And there's a rumor about uh, Buckingham Mountain in this area possibly being under an ancient curse from Native Americans who were, the land was stolen from them. I can't find much historical documentation on that. I've looked. So I'm not sure, but in general, it's just a weird place. Uh, and I would experience like at night, sometimes I would hear a woman crying and I would tell my mom, like, I'm hearing someone crying. And she would be like, there's no one crying. It's just the furnace. And I would be like, no, mommy, like there's someone crying. Like I can hear them like, you know, and she just didn't, it's, you know, it didn't phase her. Um, another time my father was away a lot because he would go to where he was building these power plants and he was good at his job and he worked internationally so like he was often away for long stretches of time so it would be me and my mom home alone you know when we have the alarm set or whatever and this one time uh i was probably seven or eight it was after a party and we were upstairs uh you know 
alarm set and everything and the alarm goes off in the middle of the night so my mom like has me like attached to her hip and is like peering over the steps because we knew which motion sensor had gone off and one of the party balloons was literally like floating in front of the motion sensor like a person like we watched it and it was moving like a person would walk and then it stopped and just floated up to the ceiling and that was it and we were like what was that you know and it was like very creepy like we would have a lot of these like weird experiences um another time i where, started where was this? uh bucks county pennsylvania in my old oh. neighborhood so and i don't mind giving that neighborhood away unless you don't want me to say it for the people living there now oh no it's fine <laughs> but uh it was timber knoll was the name of the neighborhood but yeah don't go bother the people if you're listening because it's a very quiet neighborhood but i'll tell you there's a lot of strange things there it's a very heavily wooded area and then like farmland outside of that so just kind of it's suburban but like more on the rural side than suburban you know and the houses are spread apart so there's a lot of like space in between um i mean uh, you had a lot of paranormal stuff happen i've had yes uh some experience or stuff and i've had a boatload of paranormal stuff so isn't i think they go together which is interesting but it was years before I started talking to a friend who's an actual paranormal investigator and I would tell him stuff that I was like, yeah, this was a poltergeist experience that I had as a kid. And he was like, that's not a normal poltergeist experience. Like people don't have that. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, yeah, that's not a poltergeist. I don't know what that was. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, you know, so. I don't well, know. there's a, there's a segment of reality that kind of overlaps where you don't know which it is. Yeah. Like, for instance, uh, did you ever see the Mothman Prophecies? The I love, so, yes, and I love John Keel, so I love the book as well. And this guy who wrote the screenplay, Richard Haddam, is obsessed with high strangeness, and I think he did a beautiful job portraying it in that movie because of just how it works. But you well, can explain it for those watching who may not, or listening, who may not know. The only reason I brought it up was because Keel claimed in the book that he interviewed that he personally interviewed more experiencers than anybody alive in the, at that time and he one of the things he said besides that was that um that if a person had seen something in the sky they would have they would be very likely to have paranormal stuff happen in their house afterwards mm -hmm. and so he was one of the first people to tie the paranormal with aliens. Yeah. So um, you have a, you wonder which it comes, whether, you know. Chicken and the egg scenario here. Yeah. Well, uh, we could go off in a tangent. Yeah, I know. I don't, I I have, don't, I don't want to do I, that. Yeah, I don't want to get too distracted either, but I will just say. I think a lot of it is because they have like, and again, I don't know if this is technology or something more metaphysical and that could be a combination of both, but I think they have the ability to be invisible. So they could be acting like ghosts to us because we just can't see them and they're moving around doing things. So like, you know, and a lot of times I find they try to send messages to you by doing things that we would consider ghostly or paranormal, but it's different, like like leaving or moving objects or things like that. Like, it's like they're trying to communicate, like, yes, we're here. Yes, we're real and leave things like that. But it's not, at least that's from my experience and what I've heard from people I know, it seems. So, so do you know David Icke is? Yes, I know of David Icke. I've, I've never met him, but I've, I've, well, I've, I've never read met him either, stories. but I, I had heard him speak a while back and, just the other day, you know, less than a month ago, I, uh, two or three weeks ago, I heard the first segment of a very recent conversation he had hmm. on a podcast. And he basically said that the guy asked him about the connection between aliens and demons. And he's, I don't, I don't know if he actually at, was asked the question or if he volunteered it, but basically what he said was that aliens are demons. Hmm. And I was like, uh, no. No. Uh, you have demons, you have aliens, you have demons pretending to be aliens and aliens. And pretending to be, be demons. demons. You got but, ghosts, you got you gods, have, well, gods, little G gods. You got you got everything, basically. You got the gamut, so. You got aliens that, that are probably uh, 
um, influenced by demons. You've got archons that the old, uh, let's see, Christian, uh, Christ was a Gnostic, agnostic, and the Gnostics uh, had the archons. And if you believe, some people talk about archons like it's a known fact when it was really, it's really just part of a religion. Yeah, it's I'm like not. Demon, demons are yeah. part of a religion. But yeah. malevolent spirits predate Christianity. So malevolent spirits are not part of religion. The naming of them and the, and the attempted understanding of them is the religious part. But the fact that malevolent experience, uh, spirits exist is not a religious, that's a spiritual thing. Right. right. Well, well, and benevolent and, spirits existed too. Like you got both. So it, both of these things predate Christianity before they become angels and demons. There've been positive and negative encounters with otherworldly entities. So yeah, I, I hate, I try not to lump anything under categories yet, especially like, you know, I know experiencers who are really anxious to be like, oh, I'm in contact with the Pleiadians and stuff. And I'm like, maybe, but we, if they don't name it that themselves and until we know more, like, I'm so hesitant to assign titles to things. But, you know, if something's going to act in a malevolent manner, it's malevolent. If something's going to act in a benevolent manner, it's benevolent. If it's more gray, it's more gray. You got to question things, you know, and you have to learn to use your discernment, which is a big thing with experiencers, is being discerning about what's happening to them. Um, so do you know yeah. Rob Gutierrez? Oh, that name sounds familiar. No. He's, he calls himself the the E.T. Whisperer. Okay. He's, a, he's a channeler, and he channels this humongous number of different wow. uh, sets of beings. And uh, I was listening to him today uh, on the way to the park, and he said uh, that the Pleiades, Pleiades is such a large cluster. It's like tens of thousands of races yep. the one cluster so when you say the Pleiadians, we're talking about ten thousand yep. different races <laughs> that could be well and just put it in terms of earth you you take a swath of ten thousand people are they all good people well good is a relative morality is relative but i'm just saying are they good or bad people can you really judge that like there's a lot it, there's so much more nuance it's I tell people dealing with these entities is just like dealing with people. You know, the, the famous phrase, as above, so below, that applies here. Why? Because they, in a way, they are just people. Yes, do they have better tech and are they more maybe spiritually advanced or some of them more intelligent than us? Or like, if you want to go with like, are they an alpha predator, some of them compared to us? Like, probably, but that doesn't necessarily make them better doesn't make them worse either you're just dealing with another group of people so you know people have to be discerning when dealing with these entities and i'm not saying that they're all bad or they're all good or whatever just you know keep an open mind don't assign too much until we know more as disclosure goes on because i just i i hesitate to do that personally <laughs> yeah well we got our hitler and we got our jeffrey Dahmers, and we got yeah I was in the woods one time sitting there trying to meditate uh, in Houston, Texas, and uh, there was a a metro, Houston Metro, uh, he was a driver for a Houston Metro bus. He had the uniform on him at the time. Oh, yeah. The guy was like 350 pounds, and he was huge, and he was staring at me like I was a lollipop, mm. and I got the, the feeling I, I'm sitting here in, the, in a middle of a bush back in the middle of out in the middle of nowhere yeah. this guy's looking at me like he wants to cut me up and lick me just before he cuts me up you know that sort of thing and uh, it, it gave me a real creepy feeling i mean it was really strange trust your gut always trust <laughs> your gut as speaking as someone who has gotten out of some very tough situations with some people like trust your gut it's usually right like yeah it's, so that tell, is. tell us the next strange sure. thing so here's the big stuff now, because this is about that time. Well, even before that, I'd say around eight, I started getting these dreams. And to be honest with you, I don't know when they started, but I started to have dreams of floating above my body while I was sleeping. And I would go on these adventures and I, you know, I would think, call them just dreams. And I kept a dream diary starting when I was eight. And, you know, I would have these very elaborate dreams. And then somewhere in that time, 
I started saying like, ah, yes, I use dreams to get to the astral plane, but I spelled it P-L-A-I-N. I was a pretty smart kid, like gifted level. I knew how to spell and my mother was super Catholic and would never let me near occult books at that point. So how did I know about that concept and why did I spell it wrong? Well, in my mind, the only way I could have known it is if someone told me about it, but I don't, you know, I don't have a memory of learning that concept. I just started talking in my dream diary about an astral plane. Um, and basically I learned how to traverse this astral plane and I could access it through my dreams. And that was like a thing that I just knew I could do as a child. Um, and I started having some very, I'd say terrifying dreams and experiences that spooked me. Um, and I don't think this was related to my entities. I think I was just running into stuff because you explore without any training, you're going to get into trouble in situations like that, you know? Um, and when I was turning nine or I had turned nine, how old? Well, I'm trying to remember now. Because I was, I guess I was turning nine. Fifth grade, you're usually nine, right? Nine or ten. You're ten, I think. Uh, I always get my ages mixed up. First is sixth grade, so six plus five is eleven. Oh, so I was, so that I was, okay, so I was a lot younger than everyone else. Okay, well, I was nine, and uh, I had switched schools. Like, we had moved, and I went to a new school, and, uh, the other kids did not like me like they they thought I was really weird I don't know if I was doing things that made me particularly weird I actually had the realization recently that I was starting to get what I'd say budding psi abilities that I didn't know what they were so I thought I was going crazy like like I didn't know what was happening the other kids thought I was weird and they would like actively avoid me so this one day I'm out on the playground and I'm on the swing set and uh, the other kids were totally on the other side, like be, like past the soccer fields playing. And all the chaperones were with them, which is not typical. They don't leave children by themselves. So the fact that there was no adult chaperones with me is odd, to say the least. Um, while I was sitting on the swings, there was suddenly a man in front of me. Now, I have no recollection of him walking up. I have no recollection of where he came from. It was just one minute. There was nobody there. Next minute, there was a man standing in front of me. This man was tall. He had, you know, beautiful blonde hair. Uh, he was wearing a blue jumpsuit. No, and like royal blue. No seams, no zippers, no buttons that I could see. And he had a silver belt around his waist, which I even write in my childhood diaries, did something. But I don't say what it did. I don't think I knew what it did. I just knew instinctively that does something. I could not look past his waist. In my mind, I thought this man's a teacher. He didn't look like anything, like any teacher at my school. So that didn't make any sense. And I thought there were children with him because there were short people with him. But I couldn't look at them. I couldn't look at them. I could only look at him. Uh, he had the most stunning still has the most stunning blue eyes I have ever seen. Like the only comparison in human form that I can give is Richard Harris, you know, young Richard Harris, Camelot, like my mom's favorite actor, those blue, blue eyes. That's like the closest. Uh, but his eyes almost seemed to glow. Like they almost had like a bioluminescence to them. Like it was, it was unnatural, but it didn't scare me. The other impression I got was like, I already knew him but I had never met him before. So how could I know him? Uh, and he approached me and he was, you know, he kind of like bent over a little on his knees. So he was more level with me. And he was like, you know, um, oh, cause I was singing to myself on the swings. And so he's like, that's, that's very lovely. What are you singing? I don't remember his lips ever moving. So for me, this conversation happened in my mind, but it was as clear as if he was talking uh, to me. He had a very clear like Oxford British accent, like very posh, very clean, uh, very well-spoken. And he was like, you know, that song's lovely. What are you singing? And I was like, oh, I'm singing fan of the opera. It's my favorite. You know, I memorized the libretto when I was in third grade and I was just like started rambling at him. Um, and he's like, but why are you by yourself? That strikes me as very lonely and very sad. 
and I didn't want to admit that I was being bullied by these other kids. So, you know, you, you, you do what kids do and you try to like make excuses like, oh, well, I don't know. I think they're just over there. And it was like he snapped images from my head. Like both of us were experiencing my memories and he was seeing moments of the other kids pushing me over and stealing my hat from me. Like, you know, me sitting at a lunch table and three tables between me and the rest of the school, like me by myself. And he was just kind of flipping through these memories, like rapid pace. And then it stopped. And he was just like, yeah, like, um, you know, like, yeah, like that strikes me as very sad. Like, well, you know, do you want to be my friend? And, you know, my mom had me in church choir at that point. And all, they were all adults. I was the only child. So for me, it wasn't a weird concept of being friends with an adult. Like, I know most people would be like, oh, stranger danger. But like, I didn't have any fear of him, like no fear. And I was just like, you know, like, yeah, I'll be your friend. And then he said, you wanted to be an astronaut, didn't you? I didn't know how he knew because a year before when we were still living in Maryland at that point, I think it was a year before, whenever I was in Maryland. Story Musgraves came and gave a talk. And funnily enough, one of the things he did talk about was the potential of ET. So that's funny. But he gave a talk about space. And I was like, oh, I want to be an astronaut. But I had terrible astigmatism, like Coke bottle glasses. So in my mind, I could never be a pilot or an astronaut because my vision was terrible. And so I was like, well, yeah, I, I did want to be an astronaut. And he was like, do you want to go on adventures? Do you want to see the stars? And I was like, super excited. Um, and he held out a hand to me and he said, would you come with me? And I looked at his hands and I hesitated. And again, the only reason I hesitated was not because, oh my God, I'm scared. It was a, no, my mom's going to be mad if I skip school. Like I can't come with you, but I didn't not want to go. And he knew that. And so he kind of chuckled and he was like, that's fine. I'll come for you another day. I don't remember him leaving. I don't remember him walking away. I don't remember how they left. The only thing I know is that they were gone and I saw a silver streak from behind the school. And that was that. That was my first like real experience. A minute later, I had started to forget the conversation and I just suddenly felt uneasy. Like, oh, I should go be with the other kids. Why am I over here by myself? And I went and I rejoined them. I completely forgot about that conversation. I had no memory of that conversation at all. So, so you recovered time. it under, under regression? Yes. But well, I always, I had a memory of sitting on a swing set, talking to adults, like talking to people. And I was like, why do I have this memory? Because it doesn't make any sense. Like I was by myself in the playground. Like, why would I be there like talking to an adult? And I had that memory for years and I couldn't place it until we did the regression. And then I remembered it and I was like, oh, because I made a note of it in my childhood diaries as well, but it was like vague. So I didn't, I could, I didn't remember, you know. I had heard you tell that story before. So I'm oh. familiar with that one. I know That's you okay. are. It's okay. It's no, it's no big deal. <laughs> Uh, go on to your next interesting story. Okay, the next one is the abduction. Do you want me to tell a shorter version? Because no, I, don't, I, want, I want every you want the whole thing. I want every 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 color variation. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a lot. So, uh, t about two weeks later, it couldn't have been that much later. I was only at the school for fall and, and part of spring semester. My mom pulled me out in March because the bullying had gotten so bad that she would just, she just didn't want me there anymore. So, you know, my time frame for when this could have happened is very small, which is handy for like placing when it was. So I suspect that that had happened in probably late August or early September. And I suspect that this happened in either late September, early October. Now I've looked at the weather patterns and I've tried to place it. And the only date that seems to fit is September 15th, 1997. But I don't know that that's the date. That's just like the date that fits the weather patterns. So it was an unseasonably hot fall day because back then we still had a real fall. <laughs> so it you know was normally a little colder, but that day was like in the 70s and I was sweating. And I remember this. So the way my neighborhood was laid out, there's like a cul-de-sac and in the center, there's like a median uh, and it like splits the road into a one way. So you come in, go around, come out. And in the middle of that median um, was my house and another neighbor's house, like two houses in the woods in the middle of this median. So the bus driver would always drive me up 
drop me at my house and keep going because he had to turn around anyway and he never had to like get off the road. So my mom never had to go to a corner to wait for me ever because she just didn't. My parents were paranoid. They would always keep the house locked. So I would just go up, you know, normally she'd know what time I'd be there. So she'd already have the door open and she'd be waiting for me and bring me in or whatever. Uh, or, you know, I would knock on the door and she'd let me in. This day, the bus driver dropped me at the entrance to my neighborhood. So all the way out at the front sign, he opened the door and I was like, you know, being a precocious and annoying nine-year-old, I was like, this isn't my stop. And he was like, it is today. And I was like, okay. And I got out and he left. It was beautiful out, like blue sky, clouds, perfect. Like it was, it was hot, but it was beautiful. And, you know, I didn't get any sense of unease until I hit the trees, the tree line where the median was. And it was almost like the second that I stepped under the tree line, all the sound stopped. Well, not all the sound. It was like it went still. So the only thing that I could hear was my feet walking on the leaves, but everything else was silent. And as I'm going, I'm thinking to myself, this is weird because like this is a neighborhood full of kids everybody's home from school now like people should be outside playing because the weather's great and like my neighborhood was a noisy kid neighborhood that's just how my neighborhood was but there was nothing but it was almost like the second I had that thought like there should be children playing I suddenly started to hear kids singing ring around the rosy and I couldn't place where the sound was coming from it didn't seem like it was coming from anywhere and it it was almost like it was just in my head, but like I knew it was coming from somewhere outside of myself. And that's when I started to panic because I also was like, those aren't children. Like, I don't know who's singing that or what that is, but like, that's not kids. Um, I like to read. I was obsessed at that point with Irish folklore. And so the thought that came into my head was, Finvar is coming and his evil host to come and take me away. I don't know why that was the thought I had, but that's the thought I had. And I started to run because I was panicking and I felt that something was bearing down on me from behind me, but I wouldn't look at it. And, you know, everyone always asks like, what did the ship look like? What did they look like? I don't know. And the reason is, is because as a child, my reaction to fear was to not look at things or to pretend that I didn't see them. Even if I sense things, I was like, nope, not going to look. Um, so I knew that this was coming down and like bearing down on me, but I wouldn't look. Um, and for me at the time, I experienced no missing time, but I missed like placement. So I was running and the next thing I was running up my driveway and I shouldn't have been there yet. And I was like, what just happened? Like, you know, so for me, I didn't miss any time in the moment. And I ran up to my front door and, and I, was hearing in my head, like screaming, like a battlefield. I had no idea what I was hearing. There was like a red mist in the air. And I was like running up to my front door and banging on the door and nobody heard me. Like nobody heard me. My mom didn't hear me, nobody. And then, you know, uh, I think I just sat down on the front stoop kind of defeated. Cause I was like, I guess no one's coming to get me. And my mom opened the door and I was out there and she was like, where have you been? I was just coming to look for you. And she was like putting her coat on. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, you're 45 minutes late. And I had no, like, no memory of any time missing at all, except for that little like gap. So years and years and years later, I remembered what happened during that gap. So what happened was, as I was running, uh, I froze suddenly, like I was paralyzed, I couldn't move. And then I felt like I was being lifted up and I was up in the air, but I didn't feel any inertia. Like there was no like, you know, like on a roller coaster, like there was no, my stomach didn't flop, nothing. I was just up in the air and I blacked out. And when I woke up, I was in this room, which was a huge space, like very metallic. Uh, there, it, it was very busy. It looked like what now I'd call a medical bay. But as a child, I called it the mezzanine. And I don't know why I called that space the mezzanine, but it was the mezzanine in my head. That's what I called it. And there was like partitions in some places. And there was what I thought at first was children moving around. But pretty quickly, I was like, those aren't children because they were classic small grays, small gray beings, you know, black almond shaped eyes, barely any nose, barely any mouth, very short. And they were all doing something. They all felt like you know, like worker bees, they had a function, they had something to do, so they would be doing it. Um, 
the floor that we were on was like the base level, but there was like four or five levels above me that I could see that looked like hallways. And the edge of the hallways had this beautiful balcony that was like a curved, like goldish copper metal, like at the end. So it was like, that would be like the balcony, like overlooking and it went up each floor. And it was, it was actually very, it wasn't ornate. Like it was very minimalistic, but it was beautiful. Um, But you know, I'm out of it. I'm in a daze. I'm kind of trying to take this in, but I feel like now I would say I was drugged. Back then, I didn't know why I was feeling like I was feeling. I was just out of it, you know? And I'm laying on a table and I realize I'm completely naked. All my clothes are gone. Uh, I look over and there's a man in his 40s, also naked on another table, like a distance away with more of these beings around him. And I freaked out at that because I didn't want to see that. So I looked the other way, you know? And there was this white light that was it kept moving like it wasn't stationary and it didn't seem to be connected to everything and it was almost like it was purposefully in my face so it was keeping a lot of things in silhouette so I was catching all of this from between this light like blocking my vision and in silhouette like out from you know behind this light came this thing which for years I had a screen memory of like an astronaut and I was like well that doesn't make any sense and through hypnosis we figured out that it was a mantis being so a green being with like a pointed you know bottom of his face I I vaguely remember like mandibles but it's really hard for me to focus on him because I was so freaked out by this that like I put another memory in front of it because I couldn't you know focus on him I don't remember if he had human hands or mantis hands everyone asks me that I don't I don't remember because I was just like what what is this you know um and he seemed surprised that I was awake uh I remember that I remember getting that flash of surprise like you're not supposed to be awake you know and he comes up and he's like uh he he holds up a metal thing to my nose I don't remember if he put it up my nose or just held it next to it but I felt a really sharp pain like up in my nose and um you know he he kind of moved away and he was very brusque like a doctor with the worst bedside manner is how I describe this being and he was just like we're done here take her And he started walking away to the next table like he had other stuff to do. So these little beings are like taking me off the table and I'm like struggling to walk. And they're walking me towards this hallway that's at the front of this space. Um, And we get to the hallway and they're helping me dress. They had no idea how to put on tights. They were struggling to figure out how to put my tights on. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. Like, you don't know how to do it. They gave me back my whole outfit except my blazer, my shoes and my backpack. I had those on me when I was like later, but I don't know when they gave them to me. But at that time I didn't have them. So I just had like my school blouse, my skirt and like my tights and, you know, my underwear and everything, but that was it. Um, And I get to the edge of this hallway and there's a man standing there, tall, pale, you know, again, beautiful man, but black hair, like short black hair. And he had eyeliner, which to this, you know, back then I thought was funny because as a kid, I was like, why is this guy wearing eyeliner? I didn't get it. Um, Now I get it now that I'm older. I didn't get it then. And, uh, you know, I was like, this is weird. And, you know, he's wearing all black jumpsuit, no seams, no zippers, and something that either had a high collar or like a cloak or like a cape, like there was something flowing behind him. And he looked very intimidating. Um, and he's standing at the entrance to the hallway and he's just very abrupt. And he's like, um, my name is, you know, you can call me Demetrius, come with me. And he starts walking and it's like, I'm expected to follow him. So I'm like running to keep up. And I think he grabbed my arm because I was trying to like get away or move because I remember he had my arm and I was like, I want to go home. And he's like, like, you can't go home. We have to play a game first. And I was like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to do that. I want to go home. And he brings me to this area where there's a sunken space. So kind of like a sunken living room, like two steps down a gray, I'm going to say carpet, but it's not a carpet. I just mentally was like, that's a carpet or that's padding. So it's softer. And it was like gray carpet and the walls came up a little bit sloped and they were white and then came down on the backside. So it was almost kind of like a curved space a little bit. Um, And like at the front part there was a bay window uh that was shuttered closed so i couldn't see through the window it was like metal like shuttered closed and in this room there are five beings sitting on the floor like lotus style in a circle with a space for a sixth these beings looked like the other grays but they were taller 
and they had no face. And I knew from the second I looked at them that those were not like living beings. Like they were a machine to teach me. They were not real. That was like just an impression that I got from just looking at them. Um, so he starts to explain to me like, okay, we're going to play a game. And I'm just like, look, I want to go home. I don't want to do this. Like, and he's just like, you know, he's like, Guinevere, you've done this before. And I was like, that's not my name. And he was like, you don't remember who you are. You don't know your true potential. And like, he's getting upset because he's trying to explain this game to me telepathically, what we'd call a download. Like, so just putting all this information in my head and I couldn't parse it out. I didn't understand what he was trying to say. In this time, a gray who was taller than the others, like my height now, so like 5'5", five, five, came up next to him. And she, if I remember right, she had on some kind of robe, but I don't remember exactly what it looked like. Um, and she was standing next to him and she kind of touched his arm because he was starting to get frustrated. And she said, Exilia, like under her breath to him, which I think is his title. Uh, and he just kind of like backed up a little, like, okay. And he backed up so he could calm down. And she stepped forward and she was like, I will explain to you how you're going to play this game. And I knew, again, she didn't look female, but I knew that she was female. And I knew that she was very warm and matronly. Like I got good vibes from her. And uh, however she told me, which I, again, I never remember her explaining it, but however she explained it, I instantly got it. And I was like, oh, okay, now I know how to play the game. So I went into the room and I sat down in the sixth spot how this game works there is a floating metallic object in the center of the group it is made up of smaller and they're all painted blue so metal painted blue they are made up of smaller blue spheres so they're all very tiny and they change and shift when they're in the center like it keeps wanting to be other objects like pyramid square star ball you know it keeps like changing and uh the group has to force it into the shape of a ball. So it stays in the shape of a ball. One person controls it at a time. They pull it to them. Choose someone. You choose. This is all telepathic. You choose someone. You give them what we call a telepathic knock. Like a you. Pass it to them. Wait for them to take control of it. Then they do the same thing. They they put it back towards the center. It starts to change shape again. It has to be kept in its shape as it crosses over the center. You have to pass it across the center to someone else. So it's constantly moving around the circle. I couldn't do it at first. And several times when I was given control, the whole thing fell apart. Like just all these balls would shatter on the floor. And the gray woman would have to reform it again. And it would like start over. And it kept going. But eventually I got the hang of it and I felt like I was getting pretty good at it and I could do that. And so I was playing this game with these, you know, robots or whatever they were. Uh, and I suddenly felt from behind me this really strong sense of like pride and like happiness that I was understanding the game. And so I turned and I could see that Demetrius was standing there and he had a little like smirk on his face. And so I saw that smirk and, you know, adolescent, pre-adolescent me you know, my little heart gives a little skip because he's handsome, you know. And the second that that happened, it was like his attention just snapped right on to me. And I was like, what did I do wrong? Oh, my God, because I just I knew I'd kind of made a misstep. And the flash that I got from him, I got two phrases, but I got a lot more meaning under that. So the two phrases that he said was people don't look at me like that. That's not my function. But the sense that I got was you don't let people see if you have feelings like that because people can use that against you. So like, don't, don't broadcast your feelings like that. And like, now I get it from a sense of if you're in a telepathic society and kind of a little bit of a hive mind situation going on, or at least everybody's very interconnected. If you're broadcasting feelings like that, everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to sense it. So why would you do that? You know? Um, so that was his reaction was he was upset because he was like, why are you, why are you, broad, why are you doing that? Uh, but he got really quiet and I got really quiet and he was like, do you find me attractive? And I couldn't control the game anymore. So it fell apart and we just forgot about the game. And I, you know, I didn't respond because I was too nervous, but I knew that he knew that I meant like, well, I think you're cute, but like whatever. And so he got very serious and he was like, for now, I am just your friend, but someday I will be much more to you. And I was like, okay. Uh, 
I don't know what happened after that, but I have a feeling that I was given like a tour of the ship of the area because the next place that we ended up was on what I'm calling now the flight deck. So we were in this space that was very dark. And I thought that it was strange that this area was so dark and there were lights like lighting up the panels and stuff, but, um, it was just, it was a very dark room. And I thought that was like a strange thing. Like, why would you keep an area that you have to fly with dark? And at that time, it looked like there was like a window, like a, like a spherical panel, but it was blacked out. Like I couldn't see outside. Um, and he was explaining to me the, the chair in the middle, which to me looked like just a black office, like leather chair. And I thought it was so funny. Like I was laughing at the time because I was like, why is this an office chair? Like, why isn't it fancier or something? You know, like I thought it was, but the panels that came around the chair were this, like, I thought they were glass, but now I'm starting to think maybe they were like a crystal of some kind because they weren't quite glass. I don't know what they were. And there were symbols that looked like they were almost floating above the panel or like, like I would have said that they were embossed like above the panel, but they almost seemed to think they were floating above the panel and they looked like geometric hieroglyphics. I, I've tried to draw them. I cannot recall what they look like. I think it was purposefully blocked from me. I have, I don't know what they look like. Um, but I would, you know, he was trying to explain to me like, oh, uh, you know, this second one from the side is uh, like an emergency stop if you like when you're flying. So that's important to know. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, like, I can't fly. Like, I have astigmatism. Like, I, I can't ever be an astronaut or a pilot or anything. And he just started laughing. Like, he thought it was the funniest thing that I had ever said. And I didn't understand. I was like, why are you laughing? Like, why is that so funny? Well, now I understand that you fly with your consciousness. So it's a different, you know, you're not flying with your eyes. You're flying with, like, your whole being. So you don't need your eyes to be, like, a pilot, like, sharp eyes. I mean, it helps, but. You know what I mean? You don't need that. So I didn't get that at the time. So I, I just was like, why are you laughing? You know? Um, anyway, so while we were standing in there, the mantis being walks back in through the door and he's like, not furious, but I could tell that he was annoyed with both of us. And he looks at Demetrius and he's like, we don't have time for this. We have to put her back. And he starts approaching me and he has a yellow syringe that's full of liquid and not the first or last time I'll see it. And he um, he like sticks me in the neck with it and puts the syringe out and I start to black out. And Demetrius kind of catches me as I'm starting to fall. And he's like, it's all OK. It's all going to be right as rain. We'll see each other again. Like he's comforting me like it's OK. Um, and from that, I woke up running to my house, completely having forgotten that entire encounter. Now, the only explanation I have for the battlefield noises that I have was that if there was time dilation while they were putting me back and I have natural psi abilities, I might have been picking up on history of the land and hearing like screaming and stuff. So that's the only explanation I have. I, I'm, I'm not really sure otherwise. Um, but yeah, after that, so for me, no time, no time was missing for my mom, 45 minutes. Um, it felt like probably an hour on the ship. Like, that's what it felt like to me. Um, and as for me and my mother, she didn't say anything more about it. Like, if it were, if she were acting normally, like how she normally acts, like, I would have gotten grilled. Like, she would have sat me down, been like, where were you? What happened? Like, no, she took me in. Pretty sure we just, like, went about our daily night routine like nothing was wrong. Which shouldn't have happened. So... Also that, she, you know, she didn't come looking for me for a full 45 minutes is a little weird, too. But I don't know. I really think that there was some outside manipulation uh, in that particular case, personally. So all that happened within 45 minutes. 45 time. minutes. 45 minutes of time. That's a lot of activity. To, it probably yeah. was more it actually probably was a longer amount of time, but. Mm. In our in our time frame, it was that much time. So that how old were you when that happened? So I would have been probably nine. I was a year. I was. It depends on when it falls because my birthday is in September. So I was either nine or I had just turned ten. And um, you were in Pennsylvania. I was in Pennsylvania. So what's your next interesting experience? Oh, so after that. Um, 
well, one time, actually, not too long after that, my aunt left her dog with us to watch the dog. And uh, I was taking him out for a walk. And he was usually a very calm dog. Uh, but he started barking. And I was like, what are you barking at? And we looked, like I looked, and in the median, there was just these two glowing red eyes. And it had to be like eight feet tall. And it was just in the brush in the center. And I got this vibe, like, go away. Like, just go away. Get out of here. And the, the dog's freaking out. And I let go of the leash. And both of us just ran back to the house. Now, how the dog knew to run away and not go for whatever it was, it, you know, we both just ran back to the house. And then once I got back to the house, I was like, I don't know what that was. What was that? And I still don't know exactly what it was, but it was weird. Um, yeah, and then there was just a lot more little paranormal experiences at the house. Like another one I remember was uh, I was in the other room and my harp was in the library. So the door was shut and uh, I heard someone play my harp in the other room. Like they did a, a particular thing on a harp called a glissando, which you need fingers to do to make that much noise. Like it's not like somebody brushed it or the wind brushed it or something. It was like somebody would have had to physically play it to make it make that loud sound. Um, and so that was kind of weird, you know, but I don't really remember any. Of oh, and then <laughs> there was one more that I do remember. I was studying in the basement for some reason. I don't know why I was down there. And I just remember feeling someone come up and stand behind me and I could hear them breathing and they were like right behind me. And it felt so real, like it was a physical presence, but I was, I like, I couldn't turn around to look at it because I was so scared. And this was also around the time that I started I developed this belief as a child that monsters would come and get me at night. So I had to put the covers over my head so they wouldn't know that I was there. So they would think that I wasn't there. And that was like a thing that I started doing. I also started knocking on the wall uh, to communicate with my mom. Like if I wanted her to come check on me, like I thought something was in the room, I would like reach a hand out, snake it out from under the covers and I would knock, you know, shave and a haircut on the wall and she would knock back two bits because the house was really like echoey so you could hear it um and there was one time like I was trying to get her attention one night like I actually went to their bedroom door to knock because I was just really freaked out and I didn't know why and something knocked back but it wasn't her because she didn't come out and I didn't hear from her for like five minutes and she finally came out and was like why are you out here and I was like I just knocked and she's like I didn't hear you and I was like then who like who knocked back and she's like what are you talking about and she thought I was dreaming and I was like I was wide awake <laughs> like I know I'm not dreaming I'm wide awake right now um so it's just like weird weird things like that um and then we moved and the new house was you know <clears throat> very different uh, it was a lot smaller, but it was it was also in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, all, still in the woods. So it was still a wooded area. And this is less than 10 minutes away from where I'm living now. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's it's very easy for me to just pop over and go see them or whatever. But um, there's a lot of activity out here. Like now I know there's a lot of UFO activity because apparently there was a flap in I want to say 2006 or something. I had no idea. I had no idea. I was in high, I was in college at that point, so I wasn't even here. Um, but yeah, it was it was weird. But in that house, I started having dreams, reoccurring dreams. I remember getting this fear of like someone coming and standing over my bed at night. Um, but like I didn't, and it was a man. I just knew that it was a man. And Demetrius started becoming a regular figure. Like my dream diary is full of dreams of him. Like I would dream about him like every other week at least and like multiple times in a week. And like, we would have full conversations. Like these dreams would be like 10 pages in my diary, like long dreams. And we would have conversations about past lives and how we knew each other and like all this stuff. But like, I didn't understand it because I wasn't, I was like still coming into my own and understanding that I liked the occult and like, I wanted to be a witch and pagan. And like, so I didn't, I didn't fully grasp it. Cause I was still trying to like make my mom happy and like go to church and be Christian. So I didn't understand the conversations we were having. And in my frame of reference, the only frame of reference that I had, I was like, well, he must be bad. He must be a bad guy because he wants me to do this magic and stuff that's bad. So so he must be evil. So like I had it in my head that he was evil, even though like he never did anything to harm me, really. Um, but one thing was he did show me like basically like someday 
like, you know, like this is like our future, like together, like, you know, like this, this is like, could be a future. And it freaked me out so much because I didn't understand, like I was inhabiting my current adult body and I didn't understand it that like I became terrified and I was like, well, I, you know, I, I just, I thought he was a bad guy. I just didn't understand it at all. I get it in hindsight. I really do. But, um, you know, I, I thought that he was fae because he always said that he was fae, like, like, you know, of, of the land of fairy kind of a thing. But I was like, you're not fae. I don't know what you are. Like, you know, and then I thought maybe he was a ghost, like, and haunting me. Like, as I got older, I started making like excuses, like, oh, he's, he's just a ghost that's around, like to my friends. Cause they would have weird experiences when they would come over too. Um, one of the experiences that's very vivid in that house was it was after school. It was probably my junior junior year, I'd say. And I was walking up the stairs that I was younger because I, I went to school. I went into high school very young. So uh, I graduated at 16. So I must have been like 15 at the time. Um, and I was walking up the stairs to my room and the door was open. And I saw one of my teen magazines floating like floating in the air, like somebody was reading it, like, like a short person was standing there reading it. And the second that I saw it, I started to panic and the magazine like flew and hit the wall. Like somebody threw it away from them. Like, Oh God, like I'm not supposed to have this. Like that was the vibe I got. And it hit the wall and then hit the floor. And that was like wild. So that was one experience. And then another one also February, 2004, so junior year, junior year would have been junior year. Uh, so yeah, I would have been 15, 14, 15. Um, I was on the phone with a friend and, and I was sitting on the couch and uh, I heard this noise that's like a loud metallic, almost like a gong, but it sounded like it was inside my house, but it also sounded like it was coming from somewhere else. And I heard this bang and I just didn't know what I was hearing. And I was like, what is this noise? And my friend didn't hear it over the phone. I was, you know, it was like an early cell phone. And I was like, you know, I don't know what I just heard. And so I kept her on the cell phone, but I called my mom on the landline because she was out shopping and I was home alone. And I was like, I think someone like broke into the house because that's what my friend had convinced me. She's like, someone broke in. That's what that was. And I was like, I don't think that's what that was, but okay. And my mom was like, no, you know, the cats knocked over the trash can outside last night. It sounded like that. That's what that is. And I was like, mom, we don't have a metal trash can. Like it's plastic. It wouldn't have made that noise. Like I'm telling you, it sounded like it was in the house. Like it was huge. Like I have no idea what this gong was. And uh, my mom was like, look, I'm going to be home in an hour. Like you'll be fine. Nobody broke in. Like turn on the alarm if you're really scared. Like you're, it's fine, whatever. So she hangs up. Meanwhile, my panicked friend is like, you need to search the house. And I'm like, I'm not going to search the house. She's like, you need to search the house. So she, so my phone in one hand, I grab, you know, a kitchen knife and I'm like slamming open doors at my friend's instruction and flipping lights on basement door. I was like, no. And I just locked it. I was like, if they're down there, they're trapped down there. I ain't going down there, you know, no. And I searched the whole like lower floor. And at this point I'm starting to get pretty cocky. So when I get upstairs, you know, I searched my parents' room, I searched my room. Um, and I was like, whatever, no one's here. So the way the upstairs works, there's a really long hallway. So it's my room. And then there's the guest room and my dad's study. And they're parallel from each other and slightly like slightly ajar from each other, like not exactly across from each other. Um, and those two doors are always kept shut. So I didn't even look. I was just like, all right, nobody's here because they're shut. The doors are shut. Why would I check those rooms? So I go back downstairs, finish my conversation with my friend. And I'm like, whatever, uh, it's, it's fine. Uh, hang up the phone. And I start to go upstairs to get ready for bed. No, my mom did not come back after an hour like she said she would because, of course, she wouldn't. She's out shopping. She's not coming home. Like, I knew that. She's going to be out for a while. So I was like, whatever. So I go up to go to bed. As soon as I hit the top of the stairs, my stomach drops because both doors at the end of the hallway are slightly ajar. And I was like, I didn't check those rooms. I didn't look in those rooms. And so I slowly start to like walk up to the doors and I grab the, the guest room door and I just shut it really quick. And the study door opens a little. And I was like, well, that's air pressure. That's air pressure. That's normal. So I reach for that door to shut it. And as I grab the door handle and start to pull it, it starts getting pulled the other way. 
it felt like there was a fully grown man on the other side of the door. And I literally, I braced myself against the door frame and held the door and the door, the door handle was like jiggling under my hand. And I started like screaming and like, we're so far away from our neighbors. I guarantee you, none of them heard that at all. <laughs> like nobody heard it. And so I'm like freaking out. Um, and it probably only lasted like a short moment, but it felt like forever because I'm fighting this fully grown person on the other side of the door and it just stops. Like it just stops like this person suddenly isn't there anymore, like stops dead. And I let the door open and sure enough, there's nobody there. So I go into the corner and sit down in the corner, just like staring for like five minutes. Cause I'm still in shock. Like, I don't even know, I can't process what just happened to me. I'm like, what even was that? And my only reaction to it was to get up and just keep getting ready for bed. Because at that point, what am I going to do about it? Like this disembodied person on the other side of the door was just fighting me. Like, what am I, what am I going to do about that? Like, <laughs> you know, so I just went to bed and my mom came back at some point during the night. And uh, I don't even think I didn't tell her about it for years. Like she didn't even know the story. Um, and while we were still so my parents stayed in that house, I went away to school. At some point during my time away at school, I determined that. I didn't want to believe in this stuff anymore. Sleeping at night was getting very difficult for me. I had to have white noise. I had to have earplugs. I had to have an eye mask. Like I couldn't sleep without a lot of noise because like something at night just like freaked me out and I didn't know what it was. Um, you know, I had, I, I still liked the paranormal and I would go ghost hunting with my friends a lot. And uh, one time we were at school in the really old building. So the school was split into half of it has been there since the 1860s and the other half is like the seventies. Okay. Um, so this other girl that was with our group, like got it into her head that she was like a psychic medium, but I knew instinctively that she was wrong. Anytime that she would say something, something in me was like, she's wrong that's not right. Like, you know, and so she's like dramatically with our group, like there's a spirit here. Someone died here. And everyone's like, Oh, I'm like freaking out. And I'm just standing off the side. Like, no, that's not, that's not it. So me and this other guy get annoyed and we walk off into the newer half of the building that was built in the seventies, you know, or sixties or whatever. So we're like walking around and the air just shifted. Like it got really heavy and we started to be like, what is that? And I just knew that there was somebody on the stairs to the roof. And so I go to the base of the stairs and I just sit down and I start talking and I'm like, Hey, I don't know if you're aware, but like you've passed on, you don't belong here. Like you need to go because like, you know, like there's probably people waiting for you. Like you shouldn't stay here anymore. Um, and I talked for maybe like five minutes to whatever this thing was and the air just kind of lightened and whatever it was just felt like it went away. And, you know, the rest of the group caught up to us and they're like, what's going on? And we were like, I don't know, you know. Uh, the next day I go to class and one of my professors, uh, you know, had been there for a while and he had gone to school there himself. So I was like, Hey, was there any stories about like a ghost haunting the, you know, this floor or like, did someone ever die up on the roof? And he went pale and he was like, how did you know about that? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, in the eighties, a kid threw himself off the roof and killed himself. And I was like, what? And it was from that, he went up those stairs onto the roof there and I had no idea. So I was like, what? Like, so that was like my next big, like paranormal thing. And even though it was confirmation, meanwhile, things with Demetrius, like I was still dreaming about him, but something about me, I was like, I, I don't want to think about him anymore right now. Like I, I don't want him in my life anymore right now because it's too much. Like I can't deal with this. So I kind of just shut myself off from it. And I shut myself off from like, everything paranormal for a really long time. Cause I was like, I just, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And I lived a pretty normal life for like 10 to 11 years of my life. Like weird things would creep up every now and then, but it was nowhere near the level of what it was. It just like kind of calmed down. It was almost like they respected my wishes. Like I need to live a normal life right now. And so they kind of backed off, you know? Um, I should let you ask questions because I've been talking for a really long no, time. You're, you're Sorry. Fine. It's fine. <laughs> so um, you're kind of like me. You've had a whole, your whole life's been paranormal. Yeah. Yeah. I've so, never, I've never had a normal life. 
So. So when you had dreams of Demetrius, what what happened in your dreams? They varied, and as I got older, they varied. Um. So, like, yeah, they they as I got older, they became very sexual, but they weren't they weren't unwanted, if I can like say that. They weren't like I didn't want these things. It was just like they became they got an overtone to them, you know. Um, but. A lot of times it would just be like us talking about concepts and things. And it took me years to understand that. But, you know, he would try to explain to me that, like, we've had past lives together and like we did love each other at one point. And I was like, I don't understand that because, like, you're not here. So I don't like I don't get that, you know. So, um, so do you think these but, were actual dreams or what, what do you think they were? No, I don't think they were all dreams. Now I know, well, two things. Now I know that there's the concept of astral abduction where they're just taking your consciousness because if nothing else, I am fully convinced that these beings have the ability to transfer consciousness between bodies very easily. So it's nothing for them to take your consciousness from you, put it into some sort of other body or being where they are, or just kind of hang out with your consciousness in a space and talk with you. Like that's not, that's not something out of their realm of possibility for them, for them. It's just not. Um, so you, you, um, but, you learned how to get to the astral world through your dreams, correct? Correct. So let's go back to that for a moment. Sure. So, um, how did you, how do you see when you say you're in a dream and yeah. then you go into the astral world? Mm -hmm. Um, just, just for say, uh, just for edification, sure. how many astral experiences do you think you've had in your life? I mean, probably hundreds, but in the last 10, 12 years, like almost none. And the reason is, is because I've lost the ability, blocked it from myself or been blocked by someone else. It is very difficult for me to astral travel now. So when when was the first time you had an ad, when you went from a dream into the astral? What was that? Do you remember the very sure. first time that happened? Yep. So I was having a lot of apocalyptic dreams at that time. I was around probably nine and I was having a lot of dreams about apocalyptic scenarios. But what was weird was I knew that I was safe. Like I knew that it was not real. I knew that I was dreaming. So I was lucid dreaming. Um, and I kind of could just walk past it and I would find different areas of what I call the neighborhood. And I actually mapped out the whole neighborhood, like in my diary, like this is the, this is the map of my like astral plane and how to get through it. Um, and there would be like different areas and they would always be the same, like they were the same places over and over again, but I would walk through them and usually I would end up at some kind of staircase or stairs and if I went through that staircase or stairs, I was able to access the uh, the astral plane. Like, so I'm trying to find, like, is that the one? No, that's not so, the map. So you wrote a book. Yeah, it's like, this is the, the well, you're not going to be able to see it probably because of the camera. Yeah, maybe. But it's like, like, I, like, it was like a whole area and I would go in and then just like enter the different areas of the astral plane and there was other parts of it like other more detailed maps for like different areas like this was one where there was like some sort of containment that started in california and it made everyone really sick um and it, like some sort of disease or disaster and like you know it like went through the land and so i was like escaping it anyway it was like a whole thing but um and I would have precognitive dreams, too, in that time. Like, there were several times where I would have dreams that things would come true or things would come true, like, years later that I wouldn't even realize, like, was something from my future. Um, so when you went from the very first time you went, you were dreaming and you went into the astral world, do you rem did you just recall that or did you? I just found remember? out by reading my diaries. I don't have any memory of that. I just the only the only memory I have is from my diaries. I've never regressed to try and remember how I did any of that. So do you, you don't know how you did it. That's what you're saying. No, but I suspect based on what I said and the times I've successfully been able to do it now, I do something similar to what I wrote. So I'll talk about 
I go downstairs. Like there's a place that I keep going back to recurring. And if I go back there and I go downstairs, I can enter the astral. And it that seems to work. But the conclusion that I've made is these stairs are actually within myself. So it's like, so I'm a Reiki master now. So it's almost like I travel down my own chakras and exit out my body. But it's 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 uh, represented by stairs in my dreams. So it's like I, I go down a certain set of steps that represent that and then I can leave. So what's the most odd, strange or magnificent or uh, awesome astral experience you've ever had? <laughs> I haven't yet because I really don't remember the ones that I had. I mean, the one the one that I wrote about when I was a kid was probably I ended up in this place that was like a train station and I knew that all the people there like a lot of them were dead and they were like showing them where they needed to go and like I was watching them like shepherd them onto different like trains to go to where they needed to go and that was kind of cool so everybody knows what dreams are like because everybody has them Mm -hmm. but not everybody astral projects so how do you when you know that you're in the astral plane as opposed to being in a regular dream What's the difference? I cannot control what's happening. And there are elements that I would not choose to have there necessarily as well. So I'm fully conscious as if I were lucid dreaming, but I cannot control the landscape like a lucid dream. It It is, I stumble across things that I'm like, I don't even like uh, one time I do remember, and I keep going back here. There's a place that's a painted desert with a purple aurora, and it's beautiful. And I keep seeing it over and over again, and I don't know where it is or what it signifies, but it's like, it's not a dream. And I didn't, like, I came into that place, and it was already there, and it's different from, like, walking into a dreamscape. Like, dreams, at least for me, regular dreams, feel very muted, And they feel very, like, there's still color and sound and things, but it's very, it's, I know, like, I feel like it's very surreal. I don't know what I'm trying to say. So it's not as clear. When I astral or when I'm lucid, everything is very clear. So it feels like I'm having actual, like, life experiences, but I'm not, like, awake. That's the only difference. I'm just conscious. So you're saying the astral world is as real as this world? To me, yes. It feels well, like, but it's, it's weird. Like you travel weirdly. Like you can fly really easily, which you can't obviously can't do here. You know. Oh, you're saying it's a realer version of your. It's like having dreams, but it's more real. Mm-hmm. And I can't control them. Like again, yeah, like a dream. Sometimes do you're you like, remember I remember no any idea. of your astral experiences. I a lot of them are visiting other cities and other places. I've flown a lot of places. There was a white city. That is significant to me for some reason, and I keep coming back to it over and over again, and I just, I don't know the significance of this white city, Um, and we've even gone to it in regression, and it's like the streets are laid out like rose petals, it's very cool, but I have no idea what the significance of the city is, and you can just tell by looking at it that it's like not a part of our world, like it's like completely otherworldly. So can you get to the astral world without going through your dreams? I probably could if I tried. I've I've done the gateway method, um, but I experience what they call clicking out. So I get to the point of separation. My higher self or my consciousness leaves. I don't go with it. So for me, it's like I just wake up when they're waking you back up. So no time has passed for me. I don't miss any time, but I don't remember anything that's happened. Um And I've asked my beings about this. And first of all, he said, I'm trying too hard. Like I'm trying too hard to astral project, which is why it's not working. But he also said that there are times where they know I'm just going to go straight to him or to them and they don't want me there. So like they block me from leaving. So there are times I don't leave at all. So go forward uh, back to where I. Sure. So college. And I had, yeah, college. Um, So I had some paranormal experiences. But it was like small things. So, um, well, not small, but just like they weren't like that. So like wh- I was 19, I was in the kitchen with my mom and uh, she, we, she, she had been washing dishes, but we were like having a really serious conversation. And so we were standing like over by the counter, but not like at the window. 
where the sink was. And as we're standing there, there's a knock on the kitchen window. Shave and a haircut, two bits. And there's nobody standing out there. Like we both turned to look and there was nobody standing out there. So it was almost like this, whatever was out there was communicating like, hey, I know your secret knock that you two have. Like, I know your knock, but we didn't see what it was. And we both heard it and we were both like, what? And then we just kept talking like nothing was wrong. We were like, well, because that's kind of just our, been our reaction. We just kind of ignore that stuff. You so know? that's when you were in college. Yeah, 19. So go forward to your next yeah. ET related experience. Oh, from God. That, from that point. So, yeah, because so the only other thing I had, which is not necessarily E.T., was I tried to go ghost hunting with my friends. and They had to kick me out because I set off the EMF meter into the red like I was setting it off. And they were like, you need to leave like you can't be here. Uh, and then after that, again, pretty normal life. You know, I, I was trying to find a guy to marry. That was my goal at the time was I wanted to get married and have kids that ended up not happening. Um, but I you know, I was just set on kind of dating, working, living a normal life. And I did until I was until 2021. So just a few years ago. And um, I had gotten very witchy, like over the, the years. And like, I had fully like gone into paganism. And like, that was okay. But like, I wasn't thinking about other beings or ghosts. I wasn't trying to like, look for anything. I actually spent a lot of time trying to keep things away. Like I I did a lot of like warding for my own house and saging. And like, I just, I wanted everything to stay away. I didn't want to talk to anything. Uh, but I was starting to become more open to the idea that maybe I'm pushing too much out. Cause I had an older witch friend who was kind of mentoring me and she was like, you're pushing things away too much. And I was like, okay. And she's like, you know, to grow, you need to be able to talk to things. Like you can't just keep pushing it away. And I was like, all right. So in 2021, unrelated friend of mine was having paranormal experiences in her house. And she was like, um, I want you to come over and like, look into this. And I was like, okay. And basically what was happening was their cat would be in the room and something would throw a toy to the cat and the cat would get it, fetch it and take it to this thing that they could, that she couldn't see my friend couldn't see and leave it. And it would throw it again. And she would see the toy getting thrown, but she couldn't see the being. Now her partner uh, is part native and part like, uh, he has like an Appalachian bloodline that like could, was like powwow medicine, like old school, like, you know, like they did a lot of stuff. And so he could see things, like he could actually see beings and had always been able to. And so he told me, he's like, uh, he's like, we call it the goblin because it's a small being that's like under the chairs, like it's tiny and it like plays with the cat, but it was really freaking him out. And uh, he doesn't do well with the paranormal, even though he can see it, it does not, does not hit him well. So he was, you know, they were like, can you do anything? And I was like, look, let me try talking to it. Maybe I can get it to go away. So it'll leave you alone. Um, and they left me alone in the house and I didn't feel anything. And I was like, I don't know what it is that they're sensing, whatever. And I, I felt the presence of this small entity in a hallway. Like I couldn't see it. I just sensed it. I knew it was there. And so I was like, hey, I don't know who you are, but you're freaking my friends out. Like, can you please leave them alone? And I don't know what possessed me to say it to this day. I don't know. But I said, hey, tell your boss to come and see me. This was June of 2021. I forgot all about it. My friends didn't tell me if they had any further issues. They didn't, you know, they didn't say anything. So I'm going to assume it left them alone. I went on with my life. At that time, I was getting ready to get married. So I had other distractions in my mind. August rolls around. I wake up from a dream, but I'm convinced that I'm dreaming. So I tell myself, oh, this is a dream. I get up from the bed. I can feel the air conditioning on my arms. Like I feel cold. And I get up and I walk upstairs to my attic and I go and I sit on the guest bed and I'm waiting. Like, I just know I'm waiting. And I'm like, what a strange dream that I'm having that I went and sat up in the attic and, you know, I can feel that it's cold. I can feel the air, everything. Uh, as I'm sitting there, I got the impression that it was with great fanfare, but like, I'm not saying like trumpets or something, but I'm just saying like, it was a big deal. This being appears across from me in my attic and he has to be six or seven feet tall so he's kind of like almost at ceiling height kind of like a little like hunched but he's very like regal blue 
completely blue skinned. His eyes are like black almond shaped, but they kind of glowed blue, even though they were black. He had a aquiline nose, you know, thin mouth, but like a mouth. Uh, and I can't remember if he had hair, but he was wearing blue robes, like, like a hood and just long blue robes. Like they went past his hands. And I got the impression that maybe he was wearing like a headdress or something, but I think it was actually the light coming from behind him because there was a bright light coming from behind him. Like it, it, like it should have silhouetted him, but it didn't like, I could see him very clearly. And I knew that there were other beings with him, smaller beings like in the room with him, but I couldn't see them. And in my head, I'm like, Oh, he's, he's Fay. But like, it didn't make sense. Cause I was like, why do I think he's Fay? Like, I don't understand that. Like it didn't, something didn't compute, but I wasn't fully, the gears hadn't quite fully turned yet. So I, uh, Oh, so so the first thing that he says to me, and it's like I can hear the sense of humor in his voice, like there's a little bit of dry humor, you know, when he tilts his head and he's like, you asked to see me. And I was like, oh, shit, because I remember June. And I was like, oh, I forgot all about that. And I was basically like, we had this whole conversation in our heads. He never opened his mouth. I never opened my mouth. This was all just telepathic. And I was like, oh, I forgot about that. Like, I didn't think it would work. And he was like, well, I'm here. So what do you want? And I was like, uh, well, you're Faye. So like, I'm a witch. Like, we should talk. Like, maybe we can come to some sort of an arrangement or something. And like, you could teach me things like, you know, and we can come to an agreement. And he was like, what do you want? Like, let's let's talk to this day. I don't know what I asked for. I don't know what he asked for. There's only a few. I know things that I probably would have asked for, but I'm not sure. Um, I know I gave him like a whole laundry list because I was like, I'm only going to get this opportunity once. So like I was asking for like all this stuff. And I remember just, I, I got the sense that he was amused. Like he thought this was funny that like I'm doing this, you know, and you know, I'm asking for these things like, and I know they were things like, oh, I want to feel truly loved. Like I want friends around me that like love me. Like I would love to publish a book someday. Like I know what I was asking for, like, cause I know me but I don't remember exactly what I said. And, you know, he just kind of thought it was funny. And he was like, um, oh, we can do that for you, but there will be a cost. And I was like, okay. And then he told me his terms, which again, I don't remember. Now, uh, the next morning I remembered more. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm skipping ahead, but the next morning I know I remembered more of what I actually said. I wrote it down and I actually wrote to a, to my partner at the time and I told him about this dream in a text. Neither the parts that I wrote down nor the text exist. We looked for it later. They don't exist. We like, I wrote, I know I wrote it down. It's gone. So any details were erased. Like they're not there. Um, but anyway, I asked for all this stuff and he was like, there will be a cost. And I was like, I understand. The only part that I remember of what he told me with his terms, he emphasized very strongly every 23 days, every 23 days. He said it three times, every 23 days. And I was like, OK. And I just knew whatever he was telling me, it was extremely sacred and it was very important. Like sacred was the word that came into my head. It wasn't like, it was solemn. It was important every 23 days. And I was like, okay. And, uh, you know, he was kind of like, uh, and he asked, he was kind of, it was, it was funny to me because this is the only time I got like a shy or slightly embarrassed thing from him. And he was like, would you be opposed to mating with me? And I laughed at him because of his choice of words. And I was like, really? Like mating? Is that what you're asking me? And he was like, you know what I mean? And I was like, okay, I'm just like saying, you could say it in like modern terminology. Like it's okay. You know? And I was like, you know, and I was like, I, you know, I think you're attractive. I don't care. Whatever. Like, sure. I don't care. Um, fine. You know? And he was like, um, okay, well, when you go to Ireland in October on the third day, you will see a sign and you'll know it's from me. If you want to seal this pact, like this deal, uh, you're going to leave me an offering there at this place. Like, you'll know what I'm talking about. And I was like, okay. And he was like, if you don't want to do it, don't. And like, I won't take this seriously, like this conversation. Okay. But he's like, I'm leaving it up to you. 
And I was like, all right. And um, he was like, I'll see you in Ireland. And I think he, I'm not sure if he kissed me or just kissed my hand, but he kissed, he, he kissed me. And then it was like he was gone. And I woke up in my bed the next morning. Like I woke up like no time passed. And I was like, what a weird dream that was. And I, my partner had already gone to work. So I'm texting him about it. And, you know, I'm writing about it. And I wrote down the dream. And again, both of those records are gone. There's no record of me ever writing it down. Um, and I didn't think about it again because I had a wedding to get ready for. So went out of my head completely. Uh, wedding happens. We go on the honeymoon to Ireland. The third day, we're driving, we pass a sign for Knocknashie. Now, Knocknashie is the oldest fairy hill in Ireland. It has a stone cairn at the top, like it's very important to them. I didn't remember all the details of the dream, but I remembered that I was supposed to leave an offering on the third day at this place. So um, I saved a, a fish bone from dinner the night before. And I brought like matches to burn it at the top of the hill. Cause I was like, burning bones seems like a witchy enough thing for this, right? Like that, that seems like good without having to hurt myself in the process or something, you know, like that seems good. Uh, so we hiked up to the top of the hill and I got to the top of the hill and I felt like I wanted to go to sleep. And I remember I actually sat down in the heather and I was like, I'm going to take a nap. And my partner's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. And he's like, why? What do you, what? Like, and I was like, I don't know. And, you know, he kind of get he, he goes off around the corner and I eventually get up and I follow after him and I leave the fishbone at the cairn like I was going to do. And about at that point, the storm rolls in and we're like, oh, we should go. So like we, you know, get back down the hill as quickly as we can and we go on our way. Uh, I don't think it was that night. But it was within a few days of that, because we were only there for a, an amount of time, <clears throat> um, we're exhausted. Like, we we had plans that day, but we're exhausted. And we're like, you know what? Let's just sleep. Like, let's just sleep, and then we'll we'll go out later or something, and we'll get dinner at the hotel, like, whatever. So we pass out, and it's like three in the afternoon. We both go to sleep. And I have this very vivid dream of this being, but now he looks human, he looks very familiar, long, black, beautiful hair, pale, eyeliner, black outfit, comes and gets me. And he's like, you know, I am, and I forget what he even said. He's like, I am the prince of the fae, like, and I'm coming to take you away with me to my kingdom under the hill. And I was like, woo, let's go, you know? And I go with him. And, you know, he's showing me around his grand palace, but the vision kept shifting. And it was bothering me because it would be like, here is the grand hall. And I'd be like, ooh, but then it would be metal. Like there would be metallic elements and the beings wouldn't look quite right. And I was like, well, that doesn't look right. And then, you know, he's like, here's my grand four poster bed. But I remember it being a padded table. And I was like, why a padded table? Like, that's not a bed, that's a table. Like something was off. It was just something was like messing with my vision. Um, but, you know, he and I are having a grand old time. Like I'm having a great time. Uh, but at one point I look over and my partner's sitting on a bench, staring straight ahead, totally paralyzed, totally naked, just like sitting on a bench, like staring straight ahead. And I looked over and I was like, um, like, is he OK? Is he going to be OK? And the being was like, oh, yeah, don't worry about him. Like, he'll be fine. Don't don't worry about him. He's fine. And I was like, uh, OK, all right. As long as he's OK, you know. And I wake back up in the hotel at the same time my partner wakes up like hours later. Um, and we're like, oh, well, you know, whatever. And I was like, I had a really weird dream and he didn't want to talk about it. So I don't know if we shared a dream. We never talked about it. So I, I will never know whether we shared that dream or not, or if he remembers anything. And we went to dinner, November 1st rolled around. And I remember feeling like something shifted. Something in my life was like irrevocably changed. I just knew from that minute on. And pretty much from that moment on, after we got back home, after the honeymoon, like everything fell apart. Like I should not have married him in the first place because I had doubts, but all my friends were like, oh, all brides have cold feet and like, you'll be fine. And part of me, I swear, I swear I'm convinced part of me is the only reason we got married was so I could go on that honeymoon to Ireland because I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. It just didn't make sense like to go through it. Uh, we were only married for eight months before we divorced. It was not a happy situation. We should not have been together. Like, we shouldn't have been together anyway. But, like, it was not good. Um, and he took with him, 
my entire group of friends, they all like went with him in this situation. So like suddenly it was like my whole life had changed. Now in hindsight, it worked out because a whole lot of good things came into my life after that, after that all was gone. But like at the time I was devastated because I was like, wow, like I have no idea what just happened. And so like I was seeking purpose, I was seeking meaning. Um, so I started taking up like yoga and meditation and uh, eventually Reiki. But the big thing that changed my life was I started taking remote viewing classes with Lori Williams. And that just opened up a whole world of like weird things for me. And like, I I wasn't very good at it at first. Like I've gotten a lot better now, but like just having that mindset of like, wow, this stuff is real. Why did I push this out of my life for so long? Like, I don't know. And I started listening to a lot of paranormal podcasts and I found one where Terry, Terry Lovelace came on to talk. I don't know if you know, Terry. Uh, I do. Yes. Oh, right. You do. That's you. You do. We had this conversation, but, um, he had an experience where when he was hiking, he got tired and he wanted to go to sleep while they were out. And it was a very strange circumstance. And I remembered what happened in Ireland. And I was like, well, that's odd. And then, you know, I'm hearing him talk about his experiences and these beings and all of this. And I was like, this is triggering something in me and I don't know what it is. And I remembered these really weird dreams. And so I actually went on Reddit and I posted on r slash experiencers. And I was like, I don't know what this means. And pretty much everyone on there was like, you should get regressed because this sounds like an abduction scenario. And I was like, well, it's fey. I don't like, I'm a witch. I don't understand. What are you talking about aliens? Like, I don't believe in aliens. What is this? You know, like I just, I couldn't comprehend it. And then I found uh, Lori McDonald through the MUFON site and I contacted her and I had two regressions, well, not regressions. I had two sessions with her. And when she met me, she said, oh, hang on. Well, that wasn't you. Okay. I don't know what I just heard. Sorry. My computer just made a weird noise. Anyway. Um, so she, I did two sessions with her. And when I met her, she was like, you, she's like, I'm in California so I'm way far away from you. And she's like, but I can sense that you are a very psychic person. She's like, I can feel your energy from here. And she's like, so if it's okay with you, rather than do a regression, she's like, I want to, I want to open up your own psychic ability. So you start to recall the memories on your own. She's like, if you want, we can do a traditional regression. She's like, but in the end, I think this will be more useful for you. And I was like, okay. And so we did. And um, nothing happened after that session, really. Like, I didn't feel different or anything. I was like, I don't know if it worked, you know. Uh, but we scheduled an inner child healing session. And that was the next session that we did. And when we got to the end of that session, uh, she does the thing where she's like, okay, um, you're going to give a gift to your younger self, like for closure and all that stuff. And so I did. And I was like, that's strange. And she's like, what? And I was like, well, she's giving me a gift. And she was like, that's not normal. You know what? And what she gave me was a floating metal sphere made out of blue, like blue floating metal sphere. And I, I was like, this is triggering something, but I don't know what it is. Um, and so she's like, well, when we're done here, take some time and just start writing down your thoughts. So after we hung up, I wrote seven pages of memories of like that abduction and what had happened because I had forgotten about the abduction when I was nine. And I was like, I don't know what's happening here, but like, I need to go find my childhood diaries because I'm not sure if I can corroborate what's going on. So like I dug through all my old boxes and I found like that one and other ones. And I got to the section uh, when I was like 12 and there's about two or three entries where I'm like, I was abducted by aliens when I was nine. And here's what happened. And I had no memory, still have no memory of ever writing those entries, but there they were. And I laid it out and it, there were some elements that were different, but for the most part, the game and everything that happened was exactly the same. The dialogue of what I exchanged with Demetrius was the same. Like the details were the same, but what got me was I remembered my dream with the entity and saying that there had been a padded table and right there, in my entry, I wrote out the words padded table and I went into complete shock. Like I had a meltdown. I was lying in bed, like crying because I was like, oh my God, this is real. 
like, oh my God, this is real. Like, cause how did I, how did that happen? If I didn't like, you know, how would that match? Like, I forgot all about this, you know? And it was just, it was a lot. Um, and so I spent a year sort of getting myself acquainted with UFO lore because like I had read John Keel, like I knew Mothman prophecies and I knew some other stuff even from a young age, but I didn't know like the full extent of the abduction phenomenon. And so like, it took me a while to get caught up. Cause I was like, I don't even know what this is really. You know, I still don't like, I still have questions. Um, but this year, 2023 has been the big year because so it started with those regressions right at the beginning of the year in January and February. And then it snowballed into now I'm a disclosure advocate and I have my own podcast, like in the course of, of almost a year, less than a year. So do you oh. think uh, the Fae or the blue being or the being you thought was Fae and maybe he's not? Do you now believe that's ET instead? So I'm I'm not sure. I I'm really hesitant again to assign types of anything. Um but they have to be something. They're they're definitely from outside our reality. I can tell you that. Um all the conversations that I've had with D, because it was Demetrius, the blue being was Demetrius. He picked that form for a reason, which would take me a long time to figure out. But um the i asked him in this so past was he so was he t about it was he t yeah but i just i don't i don't know where they come from so extraterrestrial to mean means that they were never here on earth right like what if they're ancient what if they were here first you know like well, i just don't know yeah et doesn't necessarily mean uh a being from another planet it could be uh, an extra dimensional. I, that's what I think he is. I think he's extra dimensional because we had this conversation in March and I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with the, um, geez, what's the name of Grant Cameron? Uh, first time I saw him do this, there was a video. You may have seen it. You may not have. I don't know. It's, um he looks over the water and the, there's a i'm trying to think of their name i could look it up on my okay. website but um there's a group of spanish there's a spanish ufo a lot of people would call it a ufo cult but they um they what they do is they go um as a group and call in the ETs and the ETs come in with a with a um I forgot what they call it. There's a it basically it's an arc of of a cloud or mm. rainbow or some type of arc that's large and it it can manifest over the land or it can manifest over the water. And they wow. come in through that it's like a portal. Okay. And they come in through that. And uh, the reason why it came to mind just now is because these ETs, if they are, or extra dimensionals, or whatever they are, they have uh, fairies with them. Interesting. Okay. So you have, hmm. it's not a either fairy or ET. There is a connection there. Yeah. And, um, uh, there's a lady who was part of that. Uh, there's only so many uh, Americans who were uh, part of that. Grant Cameron was one of them. This lady is another one. And she had some recordings and she was real freaked out by it. She was too afraid to, mm. to go. You have to, in those experiences, you have to go into, through the portal to be with the ETs because they're not going to come out and hang out with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she was afraid to go through that with them because she didn't know what was on the other side. So anyway, she ended up taking that experience and going in with them and all that. And uh, there was a reason why I brought her up, but I can't think of what it is off the top of my head. Well, it's but, like Faye and ET, I think was why. But Well, that's why I brought it all up, but there was something else mm -hmm. she said that 
uh, was the reason why I thought of her in particular. But in any case, um, I interviewed, if you go back to my, if you're not familiar with uh, Apunia, Apunia, Apunians, that's what their name is. Okay, Apunia. yeah, I don't know it. Okay, so if you go back uh, through my 66 interviews, you will find a gentleman that I interviewed. He is a uh, one of the people that calls in the Apunians, and um, he speaks English, and the rest of them all speak Spanish. He's like the only guy who is involved in that who lives in America who speaks English, and all the rest of them all speak Spanish. So it's kind of hard to interface with them and interview those people because none of them speak English. Right. Well, I interviewed their only English-speaking participant. So if you're interested in the uh, ETs, yeah, I should look at that. Uh, <laughs> you can look up Grant Cameron and Apunians, um, or yeah, and or you can just go to my website. <laughs> <laughs> Either well, way, my website has all all that stuff. But there's an interview I did of one of them, so you can get it that way. But I have another page that's just links to all the Aponian videos on one page. So you just go to my UFO page and drill down in there and you'll find all of the links to, or not all of them, because I'm sure there's had more since then, but you'll find a lot of the links from Grant Cameron's video where he actually shows, he recorded one of those arcs or portals wow. that appears over the water. That's really cool. He recorded that on video, and that's the first introduction I had of it, or maybe the second or third. And, uh, and but anyway, I watched all those, and you can find all those links on my website. Anyway, so it's it's neat because I I know that there's human initiated contact out there, but like HIC stuff. But that's that's neat. That's an, I've never heard that before. So well, that. when you can record the contact, you know when okay. So there are uh, people like um, Stephen Greer. CE5, the, yeah. There's the the guy up in the Washington area with the, the mountain uh, that I talked to him one day when I lived up in that area in Seattle, and I was going to go by his place and check out, you know, because he they called in the ETs at his ranch. I forgot what it's called. The something, the CE, CE5 ranch or CE oh, I don't know. ranch or yeah, something. Yeah, maybe. I forgot what it's called, but um, uh, that's another one where they call them in. But anyway, if you look at the videos, there's a guy that lives very close to me. He lives in the city of um, Sandy Springs, which is where I live. Okay. It's just 25 minutes north of, uh, in clear traffic of, of Atlanta. And he lives in my city. He's a guitarist. He's a musician, mm. and he's he makes a living at that. Wow. And not as not as a not as a uh, you know as a side note, but that that's how he makes his living as a guitarist. Anyway, um, he calls. He can call in people anytime he wants, and he's got a whole. He's got videos out on YouTube that are um, they are um, uh, just. A whole bunch of his contact ET experiences all put together in one video. Wow. So um, I've seen one video of him and Whitley, and, and Whitley interviewed him, and uh, for his for his uh, unknown country podcast. And uh, anyway, but if you talk about all these people, aside from the Aponians, the rest are all little dots up in the sky. They're not yeah. they're not anything close or spectacular. They're obviously ET craft, but they're not anything really noteworthy. Yeah. So the when you see the opinions and you see this this cloud uh, arc thing going over the water, that's very obvious. It's a little it's like taking things to the next level. Yeah, no, that's that's a lot. Um, what I know based on Demetrius, cause I have, I've done contact initiation before, like this past summer I did, um, and the friends who were with me, we saw a lot of craft in the sky and we saw orbs and things, but, and, you know, we saw a jet chasing one of them off, which was crazy. 
but like uh we didn't we didn't have like close up contact but based on what i know about him now i don't know that we would because he very he follows protocol very strictly because um you know we are hoping to meet in person hopefully post disclosure um and it's not something like i'm saying not that we haven't met in person before but i'm saying like he wants to come here but he has to follow the protocol set out by his superiors so he can't just like show up because if he breaks the rules you know he could get in big trouble so you're right Co so are you familiar with cosmic agency does that ring a bell mm, cosmic agency no okay so there's a there's a lady her name is gosha uh i can't remember her last name because she never says it um but polish? Name, huh? is she Polish? Because Gosha is a Polish name. I she think. is actually Polish. Mm -hmm. But she lived, she moved away from Poland and she lived in. Um, oh. Somewhere else, nowhere near Poland. Anyway, uh, she moved out of Poland and she doesn't live in Poland, but she is Polish. Anyway. Um, she um, has like 500 videos, wow. well over 500 videos on her website. And she goes through this thing where um, she has these conversations with the ETs that, that talk to her on the web. And they supposedly uh, communicate from their craft through the internet to yep. her directly mm -hmm. and you have you have like 500 different interviews where you're hearing somebody supposed to be an et talking and you get a lot of information and you don't know if this is all fake or real or what but there's a or, there's, yeah there's an engineer guy uh who was a nasa scientist who claimed this is uh take Tigetan Pleiadians, T A Y G E T I N, Tigetan Pleiadians, from a star called Tigeta in the Pleiades, and and if you want to, I don't know if you, if you're going to come to believe that's real or not. I still haven't kind of put it straight in my head whether it's real or not. So, but I listen to those yep. every once in a while. They can reach out through many means, so I've seen a lot of weird stuff in my short amount of time being involved with this, so I would believe that they could probably reach out through the internet. I, th I think that's probably legit, but well, um, but they're... is the information they're giving real, like, or true? I mean, all of these beings, if you think about it, anybody who's in contact should be or would probably be some form of military or intelligence. So they have their own disinfo programs, probably just like we do. You would think anyway, I can't imagine they would be telling us everything straight, but maybe they are. I don't know. It's hard to know. Well, I don't get the impression uh, from what I've heard that they have a military, that they're well, all. Well, it's not a, yeah, it's not really military, military, but. Well, um, there's. A couple of the videos I've watched where you're you're not talking through Gosha to the the ET the ET is actually talking. Uh, how do I put this? Uh, there, it is like there's one uh, Swaru is the name of the alien that she would talk to for a long time, and then Swaru went away and somebody else. And but there's one male. That I've heard two uh, interviews of, and they tell ask him a lot of questions, and this is kind of interesting because it's, you know, you finally get to a male on their society, but he he actually says, you know, when my craft is over the earth, uh, I um, have all I make it look like it's a, and he gives a name of a of an aircraft which I'm not even familiar with, but it's just a regular. Uh, British or American aircraft, and he yeah. says, I, "I, the FAA sees me as this. Um, I look like this. They can see my instruments, all this stuff." 
it's pretty bizarre all the details you get into. But anyway, let's get back uh, to. Uh, yeah, I'd believe that because I've seen some weird planes that do not match up with flight radar, and I'm like, I don't know what that is, but it looks like a normal plane, but it's not matching anything on my phone. So I don't know what well, that is. You know, I was with my wife in. I think it was in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, it could have been anywhere, but it's unimportant uh, location. But we were together taking a walk, and um, I looked over in a particular direction and saw two jets, like 747s, but they were they were they weren't like on the runway. They were like standing up, like they were on their like a rocket. Hmm. on the tail which we know is impossible but that's what i saw right two jets like uh, 747s standing up like a rocket on the tail right and and then right after that um i we i saw two jets or two somethings flying in formation right beside each other and giving out chemtrails and uh but they were you know jets don't fly like that Mm -mm. Uh, they don't fly parallel and stay in parallel all the way across the sky they don't they never do that you know one jet's going in one locate direction another jet's going another direction and these things stayed parallel all the way across the sky so there was a whole bunch of weird things going on with that event and uh i've taken pictures and there's some on my website where you, it's like tic-tac-toe. You got X's and zeros and, and the sky and it is so many, you know, jets don't even give contrails like that ever. You know, like that yeah. is weird. It makes me think of um, spiders from Mars or like angel hair that people will encounter. It makes me wonder if they were even chemtrails or were they like whatever that was, you know, it does make me wonder. Well, Let's go back to you. What uh, sure. you're you uh, where? What age were you the last we left off? So this is this year. So current, current in my thirties. So okay. uh, March came around. So nothing. So I had these hypnotic regressions, and I was starting to do deep dives into UFO lore because I had never really researched it, and I was trying to make sense of everything that was happening to me. And I ended up getting COVID and I was, you know, pretty okay. Like I didn't get very sick, but I had a really high fever. So I was just taking Tylenol to keep it down. And this was at the tail end of COVID. And uh, I was just recovering. And I had this dream, dream. I felt like I was levitating over my bed. And I remember thinking like, wow, my fever must be really bad if I think I'm levitating. Like, you know, and I was in this room that I realized I'd been in many times before, but I hadn't ever remembered it until that moment. And it looked like this sort of like round room and it was kind of darkened, like the lighting in there was kind of like purpley blue, like, um, like, like not like neon lights, but kind of, but it was like, you know, like, like I couldn't tell where the light source was coming from. It was just like the room was lit, but I didn't know from what, and I was like, oh, this is interesting, but it's not unlike lighting that I do in my own home. So it was like comforting to me. Um, there was uh, the this like like a plant that kind of looked like a monstera, but it was a different plant. Like I didn't, I didn't know what kind of plant it was. I was like, oh, that's interesting. There was like a plant in the corner. There was a full grand piano in the room. Uh, there was like this like black piece of furniture, which was like almost like a couch, but it was like a seamless or a couch or a bed, I guess. It was like a seamless piece of like thing over here. There was a window, uh, which eventually in later times would be open. So it's just like stars, like just sky. And then uh, there was like another room off to the side, like that way, but like the door was closed and there was um, like another really bright white light again. And I was sitting on a padded table when I woke up, I was sitting on the edge of a padded table and there was, uh, the gray being from my abduction when I was nine, uh, was there, but she was like, the best way I can describe it is she was like in a trance or she was asleep. It was like, she was powered down, but not like she was a computer. It was like, she just was not 
like present, like she was out. And this man was in the room with me and I knew that he was the blue being like I knew, but he, he looked human now. Uh, he was pale, you know, black, long hair, eyeliner, um, you know, very handsome. And he was wearing like a blue, like open collared shirt and like pants and, uh, you know, barefoot. I was wearing a white robe. Oh, and I, I knew I forgot something. The the symbol that he has always worn since I even knew him as a kid is an upside down delta triangle. Um, and the explanation now is that that means sort of, I mean, in combination with a regular delta triangle, it's as above, so below. Um, and the symbols become very important to me. And ironically, I bought a ring with that symbol on it during the time when I didn't remember anything and I just happened to wear it. So it's kind of funny, but I wear it all the time. Um, but anyway, so his shirt had the upside down triangle and my robes had on like an upright, like Delta. <clears throat> and I was like fully awake. Like I felt fully conscious. And, but I also was like, oh, this must be a dream. Like I was having trouble processing. So I was like, this is a dream. I have to be dreaming. Cause I don't know where I am right now. Um, and I'm walking around and I'm just like touching everything. And it's like, it's real. Like it feels real. And there was this like floating, almost like, like a hologram or a screensaver of this red glowing, like ball of light. And then these two other things that were like rotating around it. And I was like, what's that? And he was like, oh, that's home. And I was like, well, where's home? And he just didn't answer me. And I was like, okay. And, you know, I'm like wandering around and yeah, I just started to realize like, oh my God, I've been here. Like I've been here many times before. And he was like, yes, you have. And I was just like, like, I couldn't, I can't believe I didn't remember. And I was saying to him, I was like, I always thought that I was like mindless when I came here, but I'm coming to the conclusion that when I'm with you, when I'm here, it's like, I have like a second life or like different set of memories than I do when I'm on earth. Like, it's like, I'm a different person when I'm here. Like, like there's, there's things that I've forgotten that on earth, like when I'm home, I don't remember. Like, you know, like I don't bring that back with me. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay. And I was like, well, you know, uh, and he's like, I prefer you like this. He's like, I want you to remember. I want you to be conscious. And I was like, well, why can't I be? And he's like, because there are rules. And I'm like, what do you mean rules? And he was like, and he sat me down and he was like, okay, so he's like, I'm from a younger generation. And he was like, much like on earth, you and your older generation, like butt heads all the time about how things should be done. And he's like, there's a lot of people, young and old, like there's a lot of people who want to keep this thing secret and want to keep this silent. And he's like, and then there's us, people like you and me. He's like, I want open contact you want open contact. Like, don't you want to communicate more like this and not like forget things? And I was like, yeah, like I want this. And he was like, that's what we want too. And he was like, I lead a faction of people who want disclosure and we want open contact. And he's like, and we are working towards this. He was like, I sit on a council that helps determine these things. And like, we've been discussing it for some time. And like, your planet is coming to a time where like, you're going to have to start making decisions. I didn't understand what that meant at that point in March. I had no idea. And he was like, a lot of things are going to happen this year that are significant. And he's like, and I want you to be ready. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know? And he wasn't really explaining things to me at that point. He was keeping a lot, you know, he wasn't, he never lies to me, but he definitely like withholds a lot because he can't tell me things. Um, and then we got off talking about uh, telepathic society and I forget how we got on that topic. And he was like, yeah, you know, um, psychic society is very different from how you guys live. And he's like, um, you know, relationships are very different. And I was like, well, how are they different? And he was just like, well, for instance, like, uh, you know, young teenagers are much like your teenagers. Like they make a lot of stupid mistakes and they fight and there's like a lot going on in their life. Like it happens. And he was like, but, um, you know, in a psychic society, you realize pretty quickly who you're meant to be with because he's like, you just feel it so deeply inside of you. Like when you're connected that like, there's no doubt in your mind, like you just know, um, and he's like, you know, and you can have multiple partners or you can have one partner or whatever, but like the people that you're with 
you know, usually are the people you should be with. Like you get, like, it just makes sense, you know? And he's like, and I feel bad for humans because you're not capable of that yet. Like you haven't fully tapped into that ability of like being able to connect and like connecting on a deeper like level like that. Um, and he was like, well, I can show you what I mean. Like, if you want me to show you, like, like I'm fully willing to let you in and like feel how I'm feeling. Like if, if you're okay with it. And I was like, like, I'm fine with it, whatever. And it was like, I had a couple realizations that took me months and months to figure out, but I realized that like, I've known him forever, like forever, uh, that we have shared many like lives together and that like we were separated on purpose right now because we had made that decision to be separated right now. And that like, I had chosen to come here at this time in this life. Like I, I chose to come here and like part of our goal would be to be reunited. But at that point it was like, we can't be together yet. Like we're not, you know, and I knew without a doubt, cause people have asked me like, how can you trust him? How do you know he's not lying to you? And I'm like, you know, like when a being lets you fully into themselves and you let them in, like you can feel their intentions. Like you just have to trust your instincts and trust yourself to know what's good and what's like, okay. Um, and like, I knew without a doubt that what he was saying was true. And like, this was all real. And I was like, okay, like I get it. And so then he's like, okay, like, um, you know, a lot's going to happen. We'll be in touch again. Like, um, and, and he told me other things too, about like, there are people who lie like telepathically and it can be an issue. So like, again, like you have to learn to trust your intuition. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he was like, well, there are beings that like come to earth and they like mess with people on purpose because humans are easy to mess with because they, they aren't in touch with their abilities. Like other be, like planets are and places are. So like there are sociopaths who will just come to you guys and mess with you. So he's like, so like you, you need to be careful of these people, you know, um, these beings. And, you know, and he's like, we try really hard. He's like the group that I'm with, like, we try really hard to like, keep that from happening, but people slip through, like it happens, you know? Um, and he was just basically like, we're not allowed to have open contact with you yet but we will like, that's what we want. And he's like, and, and disclosure like needs to happen. Well, at this point, our conversation gets interrupted because the mantis being comes in and he comes into the room and he's pissed. And he's like, you know, like she can't be awake like this. Like this is against protocol. What are you doing? And so he comes up with a syringe and starts to knock me out. And so I, I haven't quite made the connection yet that this being is Demetrius from my past. So I was like, what's your name? I just knew that he was the blue being. So I was like, what's your name? And he was joking, you know, and he was just like Errol Flynn. And I was like, very funny, you know, as I'm starting to like black out. And one of the last things that I remember was he was wearing a piece of jewelry that like caught the light. And so it glinted really brightly. And I focused on it before I passed out. And I woke up the next day and I was like, I don't think that was a dream. Like, I don't think that was a dream. That was not a dream. Um, and again, I went back to Reddit and I started getting in touch with the experiencer community. And that's how I found Fiona. And we started doing more regressions. And like that led me into like that whole side of things. Um, but my last comment was going to be on that. After that point, things shifted for me again. And that was when I picked up Reiki and a lot of other things. But I real and I had already been learning remote viewing. Um, and what I realized was the vision of that jewelry became something that if I locked onto that, I could remote view my being almost at any time. However, it's limited. He limits it to himself, his emotions, where he's at. So like I can connect with him, but I can't connect with anything else. So like if they don't want me to see what's around them, I can't see it. I can just sense him. But he gave that to me so that I could like find him like remote view like just connect with him, be able to connect with him and have that connection. Well, I didn't hear from him for two weeks after that. And I had a lot of like rapid contact after that during that time. But for two weeks, I didn't hear from him. And the next time that I dreamt about him, uh, he explained to me like he got in big trouble because he was like, yeah, I wasn't supposed to do that yet. He's like, we're not supposed to have that kind of contact yet. And he was like, oh, well, <laughs> and I was like, OK, you know, um, and he was like, yeah, they don't like when I do things like that. Um, and he's like, but like I break the rules a lot for you. And I was like, 
don't do that. Don't keep doing that. You know, don't because and I was like, well, what's the worst that could happen? He's like, the worst that could happen is they'll tell that tell me that I can't see you again for the rest of your natural human life. And I was like, I don't want that. And he's like, I don't want that either. And I was like, then stop doing those things. <laughs> like, stop it. I don't know what the rules are. You do, you know. But yeah. Um, but yeah, the the thing that gets me is our experiences to me feel very conversational. And I've talked about this with some other experiencers and they're like that, like, it's not like that for me. Um, and, you know, I met uh, somebody who who works with a lot of experiencers and he said, no, that's not typical. It's not unheard of, but it's not typical. And he was like, um, you just, for whatever reason, like you just have a stronger connection with them that like you can understand more like the point that they're trying to get across. He's like, cause they're not really using words like that. It's like they use concepts a lot to communicate with us. Like it's a different language, but he's like, you pick up on like the colloquial, like the underlying, like, you know, and especially with Demetrius, it's just like a conversation. So it's, it's a... Uh, it's interesting. And yes, so, I've written all of this down. I do have this all written down somewhere, just so it's not going to go away this time. <laughs> so you brought us all up to speed on where you're at. Yeah, I mean, we've had, so in so in June, oh, that was the other thing he said. He said something about June is coming. And I was like, what do you mean June is coming? And I knew I was going on a trip with friends to try and UFO hunt and like make human contact. So like, I thought that's what he was talking about. Well, then the Grush hearing dropped. And I was like, no, that's what he's talking about. Um, and then the short version is I made, I uh, connected with some people uh, and something about it. I just, I started getting so frustrated with like how the government was handling disclosure that it was like me and a whole bunch of other people at the same time started to get involved in grassroots advocacy. And I started letter campaigns that people were doing and I got involved with an advocacy group. And then I broke off with members of that group and we started the podcast. So, and it's like, as soon as I decided to do that, everything fell into my lap. Like people have fallen into my lap. People have donated money to like pay for my website and help with stuff like just out of the woodwork, like out of nowhere, like things just fell in my lap. And like in a way that nothing in my life has ever gone this easily. And I'm not saying it's easy, but it's like, it's like it's meant to happen. And I've never had anything like that. And then I, you know, I've been paying more attention to like the synchronicities and the, the outside like weirdness. And there's just so much of it. Like, like I don't know, it's it's been weird. So yeah, this year, 2023, has been a weird year for sure for me. So you mentioned as the SOL thing that everybody's heard about, or not everybody, but uh, yeah, the people who watch Twitter or X um, heard about the SOL thing, but nobody knows anything about it because no nobody was there except for the people who were there. Yeah, so we're all just finding out from Twitter for now. So what have you heard, if anything, about it? Uh, what I've heard so far is there was that screenshot that was released that had a very clear outline for the path of disclosure, like the phases of disclosure. Um, so it sounds like we're probably getting some form of it by the end of the year. And what I'm guessing is even if, you know, I'm hoping that the government gets on board because we really need you know, I'm not anti-government. I am anti how they're handling things. I'm not anti-government, but they need to be on board with academia, with scientists and with the civilian population in the course of disclosure. And it seems to me like they are um, not sure if they're going to pass the UAPDA or not. And I really hope that they do. And that's pretty much what I've heard coming out of Seoul as well. Even if the government's not on board, all of these other people are. So like it's going to happen either way. And there is an element of a question of whether the NHI are going to intervene as well, the ET, um, and they may also force disclosure. So ideally, what would be best, I think, psychologically for the population is for these groups to work together and roll it out together and to not let it happen in a catastrophic way, which could cause you know, stress with the general populace. Like most people aren't even going to care, but the people that do care, it's important that this is done right and this is framed properly. Um, and I, I just, 
I don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, that's that's the impressions that I've gotten out of Seoul is there's a plan in place and it's happening either way, whether or not the government comes along. So hopefully they do. But I don't know. Well, um, in my 66 podcast interviews in the past half dozen or so interviews, I've interviewed some people that kind of keep open up, opening up. Um, I don't, it's kind of hard to explain. They keep widening my horizons. Yeah. You keep, think, you keep thinking you have, you got it, your mind around the whole thing, and then it keeps expanding and expanding, expanding, and it never stops expanding. But um, these people gave me an understanding that I've never had before, and I'm not sure that I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. But sure. It, it's directly bearing on what we're talking about in the sense that, um, okay, so you're familiar with the concept of the secret space program, right? Uh, in terms of that there is a group that's probably working directly with NHI or what are we talking, or like SAPs, like what are we talking? Probably maybe not, I don't know. Well, the way it worked out is you had, um, Corey Good started it. He said, you know, he was abducted and they took him to wherever and he he had all these experiences for 20 years and they regressed him back 20, it was a 20 years and back thing where you go 20 years and you're fighting aliens and you're off with oh, wow. the Germans and all these secret space program uh, things, you know, with the ETs and all, and you're fighting big spiders and who knows what. Anyway, at some point, uh, they it's like a prison thing. And then after 20 years, they regress you back 20 years in your age, your body, everything gets regressed back to 20 years younger and you get put back into society. Now, he came up with this concept and then everybody followed along with him and s said, you know, we're part of the secret space program and we're super soldiers and all this stuff. And, mm. and after doing that for a long time, uh, he got in a lawsuit with um, various factions of people and they um, he, he they got him in court. He sued them because he wanted uh, to say that it's all his, his um um, how do I put this? Nobody can take his stuff. He owns it legally. So. Oh, uh, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. So in court, they deposed him. And basically, he said he, he made it all up. Mm. So. I, yeah, I don't know. It kind of. Weird. Uh, made the secret space program a kind of a fictitious concept. Mm -hmm. And I never believed it in the first place. Yeah, it seems weird to me. But, like the way that you described it doesn't make sense to what I know. But well, know. But let me yeah. let me take it to uh, keep moving forward with it because yeah. it kind of actually evolves. Uh, I there's a lady um, I interviewed who I've been to her meetings. She has UFO meetings, and she now charges like ten dollars a month for uh, to go to her meetings. And there's like 20, somewhere between 20 and 30 people go to her meetings. And she's, um, she's, she's MK Ultra, uh, mind control, abductee, contactee, experiencer, um, uh, and a whole bunch of other things all rolled into one. And she says she's secret space program herself. And if you go to her meetings, what you find out is that of all the people in there in these meetings, 20 to 30 people, over half of them claim to be secret space program. Hmm. So if it was what I'm trying to have, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around the notion that if it's all lies, which I thought it was, why would over half the people claim they're part of it? Yeah. It, it, why would they all make it up? When they're, these people are not people are necessarily going on the UFO uh, talk uh, thing. They're they're private. They're not people who want to be public. 
So if they're if they're people that are trying to remain private and they're not trying to get any notoriety, why would they claim to be part of something that's fictitious if and ha over half of them make that claim? Not one or two. Yeah, that's odd. That, that's you know, odd. the whole scenario is getting weird because the lady I'm talking about who claims she's secret space program, I believe her because I've just, there's so many, I've interviewed a lot of the people around her who know her, who are also abductees. They were all abducted together and they have all these stories to tell. And I know that all this stuff is real, or at least I believe it is. And when she tells me she's SSP also, then that gives me, leaves me at a point where I'm like, okay, well, maybe it is real. And then, then you go to her meetings and then you got all these people saying it is real. It's over half. And so it's like i am gotten to the point where I'm like kind of switched between total thinking it's total fiction to actually believing it. And, but it's still kind of far-fetched, but, you know, still. Um, but if you ask her, this the woman I'm talking about, she has like 183 personalities, 138 personalities, wow. something like that, because of the MK Ultra stuff. And, uh, you know, the mind control stuff is hard enough to wrap your mind around that the government would do that to people. But I went through uh, a week's worth of mind control stuff myself. Hmm. And I'm not MK Ultra. I'm not, I'm not. Um, uh, mind control like like you hear people talking about coming from the government did it to me and this and that but um, what I experienced was quite real and it's uh, so bizarre that it makes the ET stuff seem like everyday wow. stuff that's how weird it is I don't talk I've I've done 34 interviews of my own where I'm the person being interviewed and I've mentioned it maybe three times and talked to it, talked about it for no more than a total of 30 minutes total if you add them all together. And so uh, I don't really talk about it much because it makes you sound like you're nuts. <laughs> I think was, for me, I think a lot of this stuff – mentally made me feel like I was nuts and then my therapist believed me and I told her everything and she started seeing UFOs too and she's like nope this is real <laughs> so I no longer feel as nuts anymore but everyone well, feels kind of nuts with this stuff because it's out there the strangest thing that happened to me during this week I, I was in a I'll tell it a very short version of huh, what okay. happened to me I was uh, having some marital difficulties with my wife I ended up in jail, and um, I was in this jail facility, a regular jail facility, till like two or three in the morning. Wow. And I was like half asleep and half awake, and I was very groggy. And um, I was in a cell. I'd already been processed into the jail cell where I was beyond the the you ha you you get when you go to jail, you're in a uh, a common cell with a bunch of criminals. Okay. And at some point they process you into the jail where you're in a cell by yourself or with, you know, four or five other people that's, that's, you've already been processed into the jail itself. And that's where I was. I was in a jail cell by myself and I was already processed into the jail itself. It's two or three in the morning, same day that I'd been put in. And uh, these two cops, walk into the cell with me they're not they're not uh guards they're cops mm. and i've been in jail quite a few times in my life and i've never seen a cop walk into a jail facility with their guns on mm. now these cops had both th their guns and or one gun whatever it was and they were dressed as if they came right off the street. And every jail cell I've ever been in, 100%, they they make the police process their their weapons 
in separately from their bodies so that they can't be no criminal can take it off of their body right right well these guys walked into the jail facility into the cell with their guns on them and like they run off the street they together they pulled me out of the jail you know got me up on my feet pulled me out of the jail cell took me outside put me in their car and drove me for like an hour to somewhere else and for all I know, they could have gone around the same building for 500 times and then drove me back into the same building because it was a very dark, it was Portland, Oregon, and it was a very dark uh, part of the town. There's, you know, lights at each corner, but there weren't that many corners, yeah. you know, street corners. So you get a little light every once in a while, but most of it's dark. So I couldn't really see w w which direction we were going, but they drove me for at least somewhere between 30 35, 40 minutes and an hour and pulled into this other facility and took me out of the car and took me inside. And, and this, um, this place I went into or was processed into, uh, it was very, um, it was like, have you ever seen the TV show 60 Days In? Mm-mm. Well, there's a TV show you can you can look around so you can find it, but it it shows uh, people that go in they they meet this sheriff in Nevada I think, and he he has them pretend to be uh, sell 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 people or okay. criminals, and they get processed into the jail and they pretend to be criminals and they get all the dirt on the actual criminals while they're right. in the jail, right? Okay, so this. Facility I was taken into looks just like that one that they have on that TV show. The only difference was, or actually there are many differences. The biggest difference I noticed at the beginning was the the bottom floor was humongous. It was like 10 times or 20 times or 100 times the size of a normal jail facility. And mm -hmm. instead of having uh, steel tables for the prisoners to eat at on the bottom floor, it was there was none of that, but there was these pods on the bottom floor that were very very strange shape. They were made out of three pieces of metal, and they were riveted together. So they were made here on Earth, and uh, but they were very odd shaped. And I was held in one of those. I wasn't in a regular jail cell. I was in a pod, and um, there was a time where I got. It was like five days, and I didn't do anything but sit in that pod. And when the, there was one time during that five-week process where they pulled me out, of, this guard came and unlocked the door, pulled me out of the pod. I'm standing just outside the pod door looking across the way, and the guard is standing like 10, 12 feet from me. And there's a, a black guy uh, looking. He's in a cell. He's like a prisoner, right? And he's looking through this vertical door slit that's like the width of your hand yeah. and about three or four foot tall. He's looking through this 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 um, window on this door of this jail cell. He's look, looking around, and then all of a sudden he pushes the door open, and he steps out. And he looks over at the guard and says, same time tomorrow? And the guard goes, yeah, same time tomorrow. And then he walks off and walks out of the facility. He was pretending to be a, a an inmate, but he yeah, wasn't yeah. an inmate. <laughs> and so uh, the the strangest thing that happened to me in that whole thing was they kept moving, one of the strangest, they kept moving me around from my pod into another pod at a second door. And then at some point I was in a regular jail cell. And I don't know how they got me from one location to another because I never, I never uh, was, I never experienced being moved. It was just like I went from one place to another. And when I was in this other uh, one cell, the door, um, you know how uh, in jail cells, the, they have like a little horizontal uh, opening in the door, they open it up and they yeah. stick the tray in. 
well, they had something like that, except it was, uh, except there was no door over the opening, and it was about maybe twice the size you would think. Instead of being like this, it was more like yeah. that. Hmm. It was open and not locked down. And then there was a vertical piece, like in the middle of that, that was open also. You had all that open. And uh, I'm sitting in this jail cell looking out, and these two guards are outside. And then all of a sudden, uh, outside that cell, in addition to the two normal guards moving around, it, I was looking at like uh, like Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah. Mixed in with the regular world. Hmm. <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah. You get that's it, pretty weird, right? Yeah. Uh, it was like the uh, the whole theme was that the virtual world is invading the regular world, and uh, I to this day I can't remember exactly what I saw as far as the cartoons go or how it all flowed together, but I just remember I was seeing. Car cartoon world mixed in with the regular world. I've heard other experiencers experiencers say that about things that they saw, and they said that they think it was a screen memory for whatever was behind it. It's like they put something over top of it, you know? It's interesting. Well, I've never heard of a screen memory being a cartoon. I have. I'm saying I've heard from someone else tell me have that you? they saw a cartoon. Yeah. yeah. Well, um... Michael, oh, what was his name? Michael, um, the guy, oh, God, I wish I knew his name. There's a, um, oh, the, the movie uh, Andromeda Strain, do you remember that? I didn't see it, but I know of the movie. Michael Crichton. Okay, yeah. so have you ever read his book, Travels? No. Okay. Um, Travels. You might want to read. I've got um, the important part of the last chapter of that book on my website. Okay. And I never asked his what his his widow. He died, but I never asked his widow permission to use that on my website. But it's it's like a five page section of that book yeah. and I, I took like three pages of it and put it on the website cut it cut it down quite a bit but uh she never did complain but anyway you might want to read it it's yeah. he went to a hypnotherapist and he had um two attaching spirits and we had, had three or four attaching spirits to him and he had he went to a hypnotherapist he didn't know he had attaching spirits. He just had po particular problems. And he went to this hypnotherapist and they they uh, had this lady hypnotized across the room. And uh, <laughs> I don't know what's happening right now. That's really weird. OK, there we go. OK. And uh, yeah. so the lady across the room got hypnotized first and then the hypnotist hypnotized him. And then he, the hypnotherapist asked him, do you, um, what do you see? And he saw a cartoon demon mm -hmm. and his mind's eye. That's all he could see is a cartoon demon inside his head. And he thought he, he thought he was making it up, that his mind was making it up. So he, he lied to the hypnotherapist. He said, I don't see anything. And the hypnotherapist walked over to the la other lady that he put in a trance that so on the other side of the room, she's laying on a couch, and he's laying on a massage table. And the and he re leaned over to the lady and said, "What do you see?" She said, "I see a cartoon demon." And uh, and he heard her say that. Uh, Michael Crichton heard her say that. And so he, the therapist walked back over to Michael and he said, well, "What do you? You sure you don't see anything?" He said. <laughs> it's uh, at that time he admitted that he saw the cartoon demon. And then he mentioned other things that he was seeing around him. And the girl, then the guy went back over to the girl. And she confirmed the attaching spirits. And that's what made me, the only reason I brought all that up is because Michael saw a cartoon demon. So it's cartoons. Yeah, so he sees cartoons, yeah. So that's, a, that's mm. another cartoon. Anyway, do you have any more stories do you want to impart? 
Not at this time, but uh, we'll see what happens in the next year. And then I'm sure I'll have some very exciting ones because it's been wild. Are yeah. you, you're getting regressed? Am I getting regressed anytime soon? I don't have plans to, but I might. No, I'm, I am no, I just mean with everything that's happening with disclosure, I'm I am getting more weirdness happening. So I'm sure I'll have more contact and I'm sure I'll have more information at some point. But. So you yeah. believe that disclosure will happen? Yes, I'm absolutely convinced that it will. It may yeah. not happen immediately, but it's going to happen. I've asked the question to a number of people, and some people give, you know, like, for instance, um, Daryl Anka, uh, Bashar through Daryl Anka. You know who that is, right? Yeah, I know who, I know of Bashar and Daryl Anka. I've never spoken to them, but yes. Well, neither have I, but... Fairly recently, uh, Bashar through Daryanka said it was next year. Yep. It was either 24 or 20, 2024 or 2025, somewhere very within one or two years. He said yep. that's when it's going to happen. But then I've heard other people, you know, like, no, no way. It's not going to happen for a long time. That's so, what people say, but that's not the information that I have from the people that I interact with and know. And most of the people involved closely with this like politicians and stuff they're all saying 12 to 18 months so well yeah. there's a lot of people pushing but uh as i was trying to kind of go down the road of earlier um with the secret space program information i was getting from uh the same lady and two or three other people i interviewed right before or actually after her um, the way I understand it, I don't think there's ever going to be disclosure from the government because there might not be because that what's happened is the government has gone so deep and dark into the really dark side of all of that to where, you know, not only are they working with the aliens, but they're working with the bad guys. And when I say the bad guys, I don't just mean, uh, the reptilians or whatever I'm talking about, where the government has really, really, really done a lot of really nasty stuff, and uh, they really, they're never going to tell anybody that information. Yeah, I'm on the fence. I don't think we're going to get, you know, I would love to have a presidential announcement at the end of next year around Christmas time, like, my fellow Americans, we are not alone. But realistically, is that going to happen? No. I think it's going to be much more subtle. I think it's going to come out of academic and scientific sources and it's going to build and build and build until it can't be denied anymore. Um, and there may or may not be an NHI element. And, you know, the information that I have is also coming from the NHI side, but everyone's fairly confident that disclosure will happen either by the end of next year or 2025. Now, you know, am I going to in three years regret saying this now? Maybe, but that's the information that I'm getting and I trust my sources that I, that I've been hearing from. So I don't know. I think, I think it could happen because I think, I think there's an outside element that we don't understand. And there's some sort of, there's something that's causing pressure because why now, you know, they've kept it for so long. Why now? So there's something else going on here that we don't fully understand. Um, you know, and it could just be that it's time for humanity to grow up. Like, you know, we're going to have interstellar travel within a century, most likely. Um, and I don't think any of the other beings and races and people that are out there want a whole bunch of humans showing up in a starship with nukes. Because right now, that's where we're headed, is that's our vibe, is, you know, this race of people coming out there to conquer. And they don't want us to do that either. So I think you know, ideally we would go into a future where humanity is a much more evolved group, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. But we'll see. I think, uh, possibly what's going to happen is something really negative is going to happen on earth. Like some, you know, where it wipes out a lot of humanity and that they need us to be ready because, if we're going to be, if we're going to avoid all getting wiped out, we need to move out. We need of, help. Uh, we need to get off the planet. Yeah. Before that negative thing happens. Yep. And uh, some people, 
uh, what was it just the last day or two? Somebody, uh, oh, it was today that the guy I was telling you about the channel, the, the ET Whisper, he was saying that uh, that the Orion Wars were still happening. That's the mm, interesting like, reptilians and some of the, a lot of the greys and some of the other ones all against everybody else. And so um, that he says that, that is still happening now. So mm. anyway. Yeah, I don't believe, uh, first of all, not all rep, hashtag not all reptilians. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, right. The, and, and greys too. I mean, I've met wonderful greys and I've heard stories from friends who have had horrible experiences with them. Same thing with reptilians. I've heard friends who've been like, I've met a reptilian and he was really cool. And other ones who were like, yeah, I had these horrible like traumatic experiences with them so i think it's like people you know you're gonna meet all types um so i i hesitate to place generalities on anyone like that uh just like with humans i wouldn't do that but um so do you want to yeah, i don't promote, know you want to promote a book or a website i mean or... i don't have a book yet uh, my phone number just... <laughs> no my podcast <laughs> though my podcast uh if you if anyone wants to email me for the podcast it's k l u the podcast at gmail.com and um you can find us pretty much on every major streaming platform and you'll know that it's my podcast because uh it literally has the delta symbol at, like in synth wave with neon pink and purple on it so you can't miss it but um yeah it's uh that's a cool design there. i saw it it's, yeah it's very nice. Uh, so there's nothing you want. Is there anything you want to say to the audience uh, before we end this conversation? You know, just to other experiencers, again, that you're not alone. Um, for those who there's a lot happening right now, you know, I know I'm not the only experiencer who awakened in 2021. I know there's a lot of you out there who probably did, too, or maybe are just kind of waking up now and you're going to feel crazy when it starts. Like you're going to feel like you're going insane and like what is going on. Um, but know that there's other of us out here who have been through what you're going through now, like and we're here to help you. That's that's why we're here. Um, and also just know that. Uh, yeah, for, for those who want to keep this stuff in the dark, you're not going to be able to keep it in the dark. It's coming out either way. So you can either get on board this train or you're going to miss it. And what side of history do you want to be on? Do you want to be on the right side or what? So that's my message to anyone listening. <laughs> All right. Well, let me go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. Bye. Oh, uh, before we end oh, it, yeah. I'd just like to say, I really appreciate you being on the show, and if you, uh, if your buddies decide they want to have open contact, have them <laughs> uh, drop a call with you and and ring me up on Skype, and we'll we'll have them on the show. Right. With you. you want to reach out to him? Just uh, you know where to find him. So you know, guys, if you want to, I guess <laughs> All right, here we they, go. he uh, he does. So he's done it before for other people who have asked. So maybe. Maybe. Uh, let me stop the recording. Here sure. we go. <laughs>